second shift to do once um, your, this training is done. We've got boards and commission members coming in. So I'm, um, I'm Carolyn Murray from KP Law. We serve as town council to the town of North, North Attleboro. Um, and I think we have been for about three, maybe th a little bit longer than the past three years. Um, just as a show of hands, I, I certainly know some of you. Um, I'm assuming all of you are staff people who support boards, who prepare, you know, uh, agendas and post meetings and all of that sort of thing. Is that yep. generally? No, I'm getting some no's. <laughs> so do we have some board members that also snuck in? Okay. All right. So no, that's okay. I was told the board members would be later, but that's, that's all right. Just want to make sure because obviously we all do the same thing. We all have the same goals, but sometimes, um, you know, a question that, say, a staff person might have might be slightly different than, than a board member. So just want to uh, bear that in mind. Um, you know, I think I last did an open meeting law training here before COVID back at Town Hall. So it's been a little while. And, um, you know, folks often feel like these are just these pesky little nuisances that we all have to deal with as municipal employees. And in the interest of full disclosure, I was a municipal employee for 14 years. So when I say I understand your pain and aggravation, I do. I really, really do. Um, you know, the only thing I can say to this is, and, and thank goodness for, uh, you know, that North Attleboro is the way it is. Um, you guys, I don't think I have had or answered one single open meeting law complaint for you in the last three years. Maybe one? Fingers, fingers crossed. Yeah, okay, fingers crossed, exactly. I can tell you that there are a number of other communities that I work with that every single week I'm answering an open meeting law complaint. And it isn't necessarily that they don't get it or they don't bother to, to learn and figure it out. Sometimes there is just like that person, you know, that self-appointed person, member of the public who thinks that it is their job to make sure that we always comply with the open meeting law. So you might hear me say some things today that you m might make you groan or roll your eyes, and, and I can appreciate that. Um, just know it's coming from maybe this is okay, it, and maybe it flies in North Attleboro because you don't have one of those self-appointed watchdogs watching everything you do. But I can tell you that in other communities, you know, if I, if I tell you that the agenda has to state this, and you say, oh, gosh, we never do that. Well, it's because the Attorney General's office has told somebody else the agenda needs to be worded a particular way. So um, I don't want, you know, wh whenever I do these trainings, um, I always say to folks, this training is for you. I mean, I certainly don't need to stand here and read through the slides. I know you're also capable of reading through the slides and, and picking up most of this on your own. So ask questions. It, feel free to interrupt and ask questions because as we go through this, there might be some slides where we get to it and you say, you know, that kind of reminds me of a situation where we did this. You know, Sandra already asked me a question <laughs> before we even got underway. There is no such thing as a stupid question. I guarantee that if, uh, if you're thinking about it, somebody else in this room is thinking about it. Um, I've been doing municipal law for 30 years. And even today, I had somebody bring something to my attention that I looked at and I said, wow, you know, all this time I've never read the statute that way. So, you know, even I still learn something new every day. So um, with that, I will get underway. And you can feel free to either watch the screen, follow along, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Um, we always have to put the usual, you know, we're lawyers. So, you know, the usual legal disclaimer always has to come out that, we are not here to actually talk about any specific situation. Um, so everything today should just be hypothetical um, because obviously if you've got a real situation that you wanna talk about, um, either come talk to me afterwards or um, you know, see the town manager's office about whether or not it's really rises to a level of something that we should talk about. But in this setting, this is not really something you should take as um, you know, legal advice that absolutely applies to every single situation. So just a couple of things, you know, the so-called, the open meeting law, public records law, the conflict of interest statute, all of these things that you folks are uh, forced to learn about, they're all part of the so-called scheme of sunshine laws. Every state has them. 
They're almost, you know, unanimous or, or um, uniform across the country. A couple of little nuances here and there. But the whole idea is supposed to be, sadly, that every single thing that you do as a public employee is supposed to be completely transparent. Now, I say sadly because we're living in an era of these like First Amendment auditors and you know people now come into town halls and they've got their cell phones and their cameras on and they're walking around and they'll say, this is, this is a public building. I pay your salaries. I paid for this building. I can walk in here. I can do anything I want. Yes, they have a right to know what their government is doing. They have a right to ask questions. They have a right to observe. But there are some limits to that, and we'll talk about some of that today. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to touch much upon the public records law, but obviously there, when we get into talking about minutes and documents that are actually discussed at a meeting, you know, there, is, there is some overlap with the public records law there. So let's just kind of start with the basics um, with the open meeting law and what actually is a meeting. You know, what does the open meeting law pertain to? Well, a meeting has to be a deliberation among a quorum of a public body to discuss some sort of matter that's under that board's jurisdiction. So if you are a fire chief, nine times out of ten, you don't need to worry about this open meeting law. If you're a DPW director, nine times out of ten, you don't need to worry about this. But when you're appearing before the council, you're appearing before the Board of Public Works, now you actually have a public body and that public body is subject to the open meeting law. But you know, if the fire chief and DPW director want to have a meeting at town hall to discuss a particular property or a problem in town, that meeting does not need to be posted because they don't constitute a public body. So we're talking about your board of assessors, your board of health, your planning board, your zoning board, board of registrars, et cetera. Then what does it mean to be a deliberation? I'm, I'm, you know, the, the official definition is any sort of oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic email, including social media, including Facebook, including blogs, posts, you name it, between or among a quorum of the public body on any business that comes before you. So that's a pretty broad definition. Um, so if you are a member of the Board of Assessors, and um, somebody is talking about property values or when uh, the property, when the, the tax rate is going to be set, whatever it happens to be. Anything like that is, is something that comes under your board's business. You might not have it scheduled on an agenda, but it is something that comes before you. So any kind of discussion about that, should, you should absolutely refrain from it if you are discussing it with other members of the board. Because remember, once we get to a quorum sharing in that discussion, we have a violation of the open meeting law. So this includes serial conversations. So if a chair of a board runs into another member of the board, you know, in the hall at town, in the hallway at town hall, and you start talking about something that's coming up on next week's meeting, and then that other member, while they're on their way out to their car in the parking lot, runs into a third member of that same board and says, hey, I just ran into Sue, and we were talking about blah, 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 and we think Tuesday night we should do X, Y, Z. <clears throat> if you've got, if that, those three separate conversations now, three individuals, if that constitutes a quorum of your board, so, you know, if you've got a five-member board, you're there, that technically is a violation of the open meeting law even though at that moment in time, it was just one person talking to another person. The serial conversations count. Similarly, um, in the age of email, um, I, I jokingly say to folks, the only thing you should ever email is the agenda is attached, or can we meet on Tuesday as opposed to Wednesday? Or attached is the report that we'll be discussing at next week's meeting. That is all you should ever email to the whole group because anything beyond that is arguably a deliberation. Uh, so for example, we've seen open meeting law violations where the chair might distribute, you know, we, we, lots of boards do this, distribute a packet of materials by email to all of the board members, say on you know, Thursday or Friday, the week before the meeting, so folks can review everything over the course of the weekend. That's fine. 
even though that is an email, say, from one member of the board going to all members of the board and distributing materials. That's fine. If the email then goes on to say, oh, and by the way, with respect to that traffic report, no way in the world I'm ever going to approve that project because blah, 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 blah. Eh. At that point, you have now expressed an opinion. And your opinion is supposed to be contained for the public meeting. Now, I've had board members say to me, but no one responded to my email. It was just me to them, but nobody responded. The Attorney General still considers that to be um, a deliberation. You know, you put your opinion out there. That's something that should be only brought up in a public meeting. So just remember, scheduling, distribution of materials, um, circulation of the agenda, that's all you should ever email. And if you do ever have to respond to one of those emails, please don't hit reply all. Please, please stop and think for a moment uh, before you go and do something like that, because that may very well um, be setting yourself up for uh, a violation as well. Um, so a public body also applies to a subcommittee. We get these questions periodically. You know, if the Board of Public Works wanted to set up a subcommittee where that you wanted to study, do we need to build a new, uh, you know, wastewater treatment plant? Or where would be the best, you know, the school committee wants to set up a subcommittee of where might be the best location for a new school or should we consolidate these schools? What should we do? The general rule on a subcommittee is if the parent body, you know, meaning the body that forms the subcommittee is subject to the open meeting law, then the subcommittee is also subject to the open meeting law. So if the town manager sets up a subcommittee, he's not a public body. He's not subject to the open meeting law. His subcommittee does not need to comply with the open meeting law. They can. Nothing stops them from posting their meetings if they want to invite the public in. Um, but if you are a subcommittee formed by another board, you still have to comply with the open meeting law. So here are some of the things we're going to cover today. Um, cause the, some of the basic requirements of the open meeting law, we all know notice is a big one. You know, we've all got to post notice of our meetings. Um, we're also going to talk about the purpose and we're going to cover um, minutes when you have to approve them, contents, that sort of thing. Um, so one exception to the definition of meetings has to do with um, site visits. I know this comes up an awful lot with the land use boards. Um, I'll get a call you know, from the planning board chair saying, we all want to go to 21 East Street and we all want to take a look at it. Do we need to post a meeting? Yes and no is the correct answer. And I know that makes everybody really happy because that's a, a typical you know, lawyer's answer. You know, the answer is, well, it depends. Again, remember, if a quorum of you are going to go to that site visit, and if you think you might deliberate in some way, post it as a meeting. But if you think that a quorum of you can go to that site visit and just look around and confine your comments or questions to, all right, so I'm looking at the plan. Where do you, where is it that you think that this addition is going to be? Is it going to be over here? All right, and the topography starts to slope off there. You know, if you're just kind of getting your bearings so that you can acquaint yourself with the site and get a sense of what's existing and, and how it's going to be altered in any way, that's perfectly fine as a site visit without deliberation. When you start having more conversation with that and you start to say things like, oh, really? You're going to put the addition there? Gee, I would have thought you might put it over there because, you know, the wetlands come in there and at least over there you'd have better access, blah, blah, blah. That now has crossed the line into a deliberation for which you should have posted the meeting. So there's no right or wrong way. Just bear in mind that if you decide not to post, confine your comments and questions. <coughs> if you do post, you can, you can have a conversation about, you know, the sky's the limit. Here's one of the pitfalls, though, if you do decide to post a site visit. All of your meetings have to be open to the public, which means they also have to be accessible to the public. I've gone on site visits where, you know, you're, you're, it's earth removal being cut into the side of a, you know, a, a, you know like a, a hill. 
and you look at that and say, I'm pretty sure that the planning board chair who is currently on crutches is not going to be able to access that site. Bear that in mind also for your public because if there might be someone from the public who has some accessibility challenges, how conducive is that site to, to actually having a meeting? And if you feel that it is not conducive to folks being able to walk around, um, then my suggestion would be don't post it as a meeting, do your site visit, contain your comments, and, and um, don't deliberate. The, the other thing to bear in mind is we can have a public meeting anywhere we want. You know, we, we always think we can only have it in a public building. You could have it at a church. You could have it in someone's living room if they invited you in. <coughs> but the key there is that we're now dealing, when you're dealing with private property, you also now need the property owner's permission to have that meeting there. And the property owner may be perfectly happy, and I, I hear this a lot at board meetings. The property owner says, you guys want to come on down Saturday morning. You can walk the site with me. I'd be happy to show it to you. Oh, they're very happy to show you, the board members, what's going on. But they don't want to invite their neighbor from across the street who is opposed to their project onto their property. You know, they don't want somebody else snooping around or trespassing. If you don't have consent of the private property owner, you're not having a meeting. So you can still do your site visit, don't post it, and don't deliberate. Another exception that comes up is um, the, when a board attends like, a meeting of another board. Um, you know, if the town council, for example, is having uh, budget hearings, and you might have the entire you know, board of public works that show up the night that um, budgets are being discussed. The Board of Public Works can either choose to post a meeting or not. If they choose to post a meeting, then they can sit next to each other, they can deliberate, they can talk about, yeah, why, are, why is this budget item going up by 20,000? What were we planning to do there? Or, you know what, if, if you think that our budget's too high, we'd be willing to reduce that number. They can have those conversations. If the Board of Public Works does not post a meeting simultaneously with the town council, then they should not sit shoulder to shoulder in the audience. They should not in any way, shape, or form give anyone the impression that they are meeting and deliberating. So if the chair of the Board of Public Works wants to get up and wants to address a question of the council, the chair is free to do that. The chair can even identify himself or herself as the chair of the Board of Public Works. But when they make comments, they should be careful to either make it clear, am I talking right now as a representative of my board? You know, meaning has my board already taken a position on this and I am merely conveying that to another board? Or am I now just talking as, yes, I'm a member of the Board of Public Works, but I am also uh, right now, just speaking as an individual member of that board, uh, commenting on this budget item. They need to be careful of that um, and make sure that if in any way, shape, or form they're going to represent the board or they are going to talk with their other board members, then always play it safe and have them post um, a meeting simultaneously. I think I have covered this on deliberation, so we'll go to the next one. And I think I have covered this, joint meetings, email and reply all, I have covered that. Social media, so let's, let's talk about social media for a moment, oops, sorry. Um, Similar to, to email, um, I will, in the, in the interest of full disclosure, I will say I do absolutely no social media. That's just my personal preference. I've always, since, since you know, social media became a thing, I've said to myself, my life isn't that exciting. Your life isn't that exciting. Why do I want to be what, reading or watch, seeing your vacation pictures or whatever? It's like, yeah, you know, I, you know, that's just not my thing. But I, believe me, I've got lots of friends and family members who are like, I wish you were on Facebook because then you'd be able to see all of this. 
Um, same thing with, with municipalities. There's, there's information we like to get out there, right? Um, but then there are the posts that start to come in. So it's the same idea that if, if a member of a board is, is reading something that's, that's been posted on a blog, it's on Facebook, wherever it happens to be, if a member of a board jumps into the conversation, well, as an individual member, that's fine. But now if another board member chimes in two hours later and now adds something and another member chimes in a little later than that, um, now you might arguably have a quorum of the board deliberating on social media as opposed to the, the, a properly posted public meeting. So I, I always try to tell people, look, if you're going to go on social media or, you know, I, I know sometimes that there's a lot of um, opinion that's expressed, sometimes a lot of misinformation, and you can't help yourself. You want to jump in and, and you want to set the facts straight. My suggestion is if you really can't resist, <laughs> then what you should do is say, you know what, that's great. You know, and I'm glad this is generating a lot of debate, and I'm glad to see that people are, are talking about this. The next meeting on this subject is going to be Wednesday night at 6 o'clock at you know, the police station. I really hope you all show up then so that we can talk about this you know, in, in a proper public meeting. Even, even if you want to go further to say, look, um, you know, not everything that I'm reading here is factually correct. I encourage you to come to the meeting on Wednesday night. That's fine. But anything beyond that is the slippery slope, especially since you might post something, again, that is your opinion on the project, whatever it is being discussed, and you log off and start your work day thinking, you know, I didn't violate the open meeting law, but by the end of the day, two other members of your board have chimed in, and now we have this digital footprint, you know, showing the communications that have gone back and forth. There is no way to then deny that an open meeting law violation has occurred. So, so bear that in mind when it comes to social media. And I don't mean to embarrass you or single you out, but there are a couple of chairs up front if you want to sit I'm as opposed to... Them, All right, then. <laughs> from the back. All right, <laughs> sounds good. Um, we have covered email, social media, the types of, of things that, dis that involve um, deliberation, so I'll skip this one. So meeting notices, the timing of them. Um, so I'm going to date myself, and maybe some other folks will date themselves in this room. I remember a time when the meeting notice just used to be like this carbon form that you'd fill out at the town clerk's office that would say, you know, on, on you know, Tuesday, February 1st at 7 o'clock, the, the select board is going to meet at, uh, you know, the town hall auditorium. That's all you had to do. Get it to the town clerk, and, and it gets posted, and, and life is grand. Now we have, in addition to the fact that we have to post it, you know, the 48 hours was always there before, but the 48 hours now also applies to weekends and holidays. So Monday holidays always goof somebody up because they forget that they need to then post the meeting on Thursday for a Tuesday. The other thing is that our meeting notices have come from something that used to be about, you know, three lines long to essentially it is your entire <laughs> agenda now needs to be post, posted. Um, you know, it, it becomes a, a bit of a, a chore, shall we say, for folks. But again, it's, it's a necessary requirement. Um, and usually most of the open meeting law complaints that I see come through are complaints that not so much that it wasn't posted in time. You know, we can all do the 48 hours and count backwards and say, shoot, I didn't get it in on time. What I see more, more than anything is allegations that something on the agenda did not have sufficient specificity to it. And so I think we'll talk about that next, the content of the meeting notice. So we all know you gotta have the time, date, place, who's meeting, and the list of topics that the chair reasonably anticipates will be discussed at the meeting. That last phrase about the chair reasonably anticipating what will be discussed at the meeting, a lot of people, I think, kind of sometimes gloss over that. 
I can't tell you how many times I've had the Attorney General's office call me and say, did your chair know that this was going to be brought up on Tuesday night? Okay, well, let me go back and ask the chair, you know, what exactly did you know when the agenda was prepared? Um, so it, it does matter if there is, you know, and I, and I recognize there can be some different ways that agendas are prepared. Um, some chairs might be much more involved. Some might completely defer to staff to generate that agenda. Sometimes it's a, a collaborative effort of both. Whatever it happens to be, the folks in charge of putting the agenda together have to list everything on it that they suspect is going to be discussed um, 48 hours in advance. And as I said, it has to be, has to include sufficient specificity so that you know, a reasonable person who just hops on your website or who um, you know, sees the, the meeting notice posted could look at it and know what is it you're going to discuss. So I'm gonna tell you one of the number one violations that I see every community across Massachusetts posting open meeting laws. I mean, um, there will be an entry on the agenda that will say town manager's report, superintendent's report, you name it. Insert your name of department head report. What are they reporting on? You know, how do I know whether it's going to be one of the topics that I might have an interest in and therefore I would go to the meeting or I'd log into the meeting in the virtual world because if I knew you were going to discuss that, oh, then I would have been there. If you know 48 hours ahead of time that your report is going to include A, B, and C, list A, B, and C. I know that a lot of communities get away with just that entry. Um, and as I said at the top of the hour, North Attleboro is blessed in the fact that you don't have somebody out there who is constantly looking to file a complaint to say, gotcha. But in other communities, there are those people who do that. And they're going to file over and over again until they feel as though we do it the right way. And you know, they're not wrong. I can't tell you how many letters I write where I say, we should have done this, but we didn't, and we're very sorry, and we will comply with the open meeting law going forward. You know, after you've written that to the AG about five or six times, they don't really think, take it seriously anymore. And that's when they start to say, well, maybe it's time to, to issue some intentional fines. And they, I have seen them fine some communities, like $1,000 per board member. So we need to take it seriously. Yes? <coughs> sorry. No. So we regularly will do staff member reports for the previous month. <coughs> health agents, um, February report, public health nurses, February report. So it's things like inspections, um, complaint follow-ups. Do we have to list all that? I mean, we, there's like, in, in a, it would be like six pages if you had to yes. list the content of the inspections. Or you don't have to list the content of the inspections, um, but but is the addresses? I mean, that's all that's mm -hmm. stated. You could it's you could like try 20. to summarize it as um, inspections and then list the twenty properties if that's how many there are. You Seriously, could, I mean. That's like a six-page agenda. Mm -hmm. There was um, an opinion that the Attorney General's office put out had to do with, um, I think it was the town of Carver. Um, they were renewing earth renewal permits. <coughs> and they just put on the agenda, renewal of earth removal permits. And the AG came back and said, not good enough. You need to list the business and the address. So we need to know that it's John's earth removal at 123 Main Street. <coughs> it's, it's a lot. I know. It seems absurd. <laughs> Sorry. It, it does. No. But, you know, they're always taking it from the standpoint of the person sitting at home who might be interested in knowing what is the Board of Health doing 
about the rat infestation. I'm sure there aren't any, but you know, just as a you know, as a topic, right? Uh, what is what is the Board of Health doing about that? You know, because I've been watching your meetings for the last six weeks, and nobody talks about rats. And you know, and meanwhile, you're thinking, what are you talking about? You know, every every single meeting, I've, I've provided an update. So, yes, if yes. so, if you attach the report, mm -hmm. would that meet? this so you know if you included the health agent report the public health nurse report to the posting of the agenda instead of having to put it on because there's just no no way you could Half but time, I don't even I mean, know you you, you could do that but then then you also have to stop and ask yourself where does it end you know and at what point well, does the meeting notice go from two or three pages to a small booklet of information. So but see, that's exactly what it would. I mean, I don't even know what's in the health agent's report until he reports it. So, yeah. Hence the reason they like you to list out what the report will talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are, we, are they required to have the report on every agenda or on every posting? Uh, no. Oh. No. So I mean, so if, so if there is no, you might just yeah, maybe just do your report once a month, we once once do. a quarter, or something like that. So it isn't quite as burdensome. Yep. Well, no, that wouldn't work because we were talking twenty to thirty inspections and and things each month. So yeah. Okay. As they, as they say, don't shoot the messenger. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm it just is. like. As I said, it, I, I, I feel your pain. It's, it's an awful lot of detail. Um, the other thing that um, the Attorney General's Office recommends is, you know, regularly occurring items should, you know, should be placed on the agenda. Um, and I forget the community it was, but there was, um, um, do you folks do um, public comment gen as a general? How do you like public comment? Mm -hmm. Nobody comes. No. <laughs> you know, I, I cringe at public comment because I just think, and here it comes, all of the things that we had no idea what was going to be discussed, you know. I, no one gets notice of this either, or people stand up and they express a concern about whatever it happens to be, and then the board members do exactly what they're supposed to do. They just nod and say, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Next, thank you very much. And people say, I just told you about a rat infestation problem, and you just say thank you very much. You know, why, why aren't you responding to me? Because they don't, they don't understand that, well, public comment allows them to say whatever it is that they want to say to the board. The board can't engage without posting that topic on, uh, on an agenda. So there was one, um, one situation out there where there was a um, particular resident who would show up at the same meetings week after week after week and would always bring up the same issue. I don't even remember what the issue was now, but everybody always knew that, and here comes Joe, and yes, we're gonna hear about this now. It was so, anticipated and so common that the Attorney General's office said this should just become a topic on your agenda because you know it's going to be discussed and you think when did something go from public comment to us reasonably anticipating so there's a little nuance there that in, in every community and every board does this a little bit differently I'm not saying one way is right or wrong but if you're going to have public comment my thought is do not have anybody submit anything in advance. Because then you can honestly say, the chair did not reasonably anticipate this 48 hours ahead of time. There were some, some boards, I know, that if you want to make public comment, you have to submit something in writing prior to the agenda being set so that the chair can know, okay, Ms. Smith is going to get up and she's going to talk about you know, the school feasibility study. If that school feasibility study isn't listed on the agenda under public comment, it's a possible open meeting law violation. So my suggestion is you're going to do public comment, have them just come on in and step up one by one. 
Um, and then that way you won't have any obligation to actually post it on the agenda. Do not use acronyms or abbreviations. So I just you know, said a moment ago, school feasibility study. So I'd see something on an agenda that would say MSBA, you know, statement of interest. All right, well, how many of us out there know what MSBA stands for? You know, I'd be willing to bet that if I asked my husband, he'd have absolutely no idea what that stands for. And that's what you, that's what you gotta think about. Your audience is, will they understand what we're talking about? You know, if we're, we're talking about, um, you know, going into executive session for collective bargaining with AFSPE. Maybe we need to spell out that's the American Federation, blah, 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 you know, so that folks know who or what AFSCME happens to be. Um, executive sessions. This can sometimes trip people up a little bit. And um, we publish periodically what we call like a, a cheat sheet, a card on executive sessions. I don't know if you guys have ever received any of those or have any of those. All right. I um, I'm going to get some of those to Karen so that she can get some of those to, to all of you guys um, because they're always kind of like a nice handy guide that you can just you know, keep on your desk. Um, there's very specific purposes for going into executive session, meaning we want to meet and talk about something without the public being able to, you know, to observe us in order to participate. Um, your executive sessions need to go on your, be listed on your agenda. And they also, the purpose for the executive session has to be on the agenda. So I just said a moment ago, um, you know, contract negotiations with AFSCME. So you should have executive session pursuant to general law chapter 3821A purpose number three um, to strategize or conduct uh, uh, collective bargaining with the Teamsters or whoever it happens to be. Um, the purpose trips people up all the time, or uh, I have to say I get a lot of phone calls where I say that's a really creative way of looking at it, but no, that's not going to be a basis for, for an executive session. If you want to talk about um, whether or not we should maybe um, purchase or take some property, you can go into executive session to talk about, well, if we were going to offer, if we were going to make a, an offer to purchase that property, um, we can talk about the value of that property in executive session because let's think about it. If we sit in an open meeting and say, all right, well, we're willing to go to a million but only offer them five, guess what? <laughs> you know, you're, you're selling that pro property for a million. Um, when possible, you should also identify the, um, the property involved. So the address of that property that you're thinking of acquiring um, should be included. But if there is a reason why perhaps we don't want to reveal that just yet, and if you can make a straight-faced uh, explanation to me as to why we don't want to reveal it, that's okay. Um, you can go into executive session to talk about litigation strategy. And it isn't just once you have been sued, it's if someone has sent you a really nasty letter threatening to sue you if you don't do something. And so now you want to be able to get your board together to talk about how do we respond to this? Um, you might still want to identify who is the party involved in that threatened litigation. You know, what is, if there is a property address that's involved. As much information so that someone, and you know, member of the public could look at your meeting notice and say, oh, I might not know exactly what that's all about, but, but I've got enough information to get the flavor of it. Um, avoid shorthand references, so similar to you know, the acronyms or the abbreviations, um, if you say that you're going into um, executive session to conduct um, contract negotiations with non-union personnel, you are expected to identify that non-union personnel. So if it's a school committee negotiating a new contract for the superintendent, say it's the superintendent, say it's the town manager, whoever it happens to be. Um, the, the other thing that folks sometimes that I have seen, and I, I don't know if anybody here has done it, but some communities have a practice of they will post an executive session and then they will post an open session, like they are two separate meetings. And the executive session, let's say, starts at 6.30 
and the regular meeting starts at 7. I don't really know where that practice comes from or, or, or why, um, because they could just do one meeting notice starting at 6.30, regardless of whether you're having, you have other items on the agenda to discuss in open session, you always have to open a meeting in open session. And you open it in open session and you can immediately move to go into executive session and that's fine. And you can tell people that we will only be coming out of executive session for the purposes of adjourning the meeting so that you know, people like yourself aren't sitting around for the next couple of hours waiting for them to come back to talk about that one other topic that you thought they were going to discuss. Um, but there's no need to do two separate postings like that or to break it out. Um, you can do it all in one. Matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair. I think we uh, covered that. Um, the, the other thing I, I should just say is sometimes emerge. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think for that exception, you don't have to list, you know, property owners and then because and then that, that's actually something that specifically has an exemption. Okay. Um, you know, similarly, um, you know, other things that, that might come up, not necessarily in the assessor's world, but um, sometimes you might make an offer of employment to someone and we do criminal background checks, right? Something comes up on the quarry report and we say, uh-oh. We need, to, we need to talk about whether or not we think we should still make an offer of employment to this person or you know, do we give them an opportunity to come in and maybe explain their side of the story, something like that. That kind of information is also separately protected by different statutes similar to the assessors and abatements. So um, no, that would, be a, that would be a situation where no, you don't have to give all the information away like that. Um, so just one other um, aspect of matters not reasonably anticipated, I was starting to say, you know, emergencies come up. Um, and I've, I've actually, you know, a real life situation I experienced was, um, you know, someone comes running in at the, you know, stroke of like one minute before a meeting to, ready to begin. This grant application is due tomorrow and we're going to, we're not going to, you know, we may lose, uh, you know, $2 million if we don't get this in and we need that board to vote on this. It's not on the agenda. And you didn't know this 48 hours. The chair could still say, this literally just came in. We did not know about it 48 hours in advance. The attorney general's office will always tell you that the best practice is that if that emergency can wait to your next regularly scheduled meeting, put it off to the next meeting, put it on your agenda to vote to approve the grant application for whatever it happens to be. But if you're truly going to um, risk uh, the opportunity for grant funds, if this application isn't approved tonight and signed and sent in tomorrow, take it up. Put it on, you know, take it up. I just have the chair make some sort of announcement that this is something that was not reasonably anticipated, but it is time sensitive and in the best interest of the town, we are going to take it up. Um, what some boards will also do, just as sort of a, a belt and suspenders approach, they will then take that emergency item and they will put it on their next regularly scheduled agenda so that anybody who didn't watch or didn't attend the meeting when the emergency was addressed can now at least ask questions, find out what happened, and the board essentially ratifies the vote that it took previously. And that is, you know, to the extent that they shouldn't have taken it up as an emergency, this kind of cures that. Time stamping the notice. Well, this is something that is near and dear to the town clerk's heart and understanding that, you know, um, in order, you know, when, believe it or not, like I said, when we respond to open meeting laws, we always look at, give me a copy of the posting. I wanna see when was it filed. When was, if it was modified, what is, when was it modified? We need to know all of that. Um, it is important to prove whether or not the meeting was, was timely posted. Um, 
a question that, that uh, came up earlier. You know, a meeting may not be continued from one night to the next unless the meeting is properly posted under the open meeting law for the continued time. The same goes for hearings. Um, you know, there's, there's a slight difference between a meeting of the board is any time the board gets together to discuss anything. Then there are also certain times when you have to have a hearing, a public hearing. And the public hearing, the distinction is, you know, as far, far as the meeting is concerned, everyone has the right to attend the meeting and the right to listen and observe. They only get the right to participate when it's actually a public hearing, at which point, you know, the, the chair has to invite the public to make any comments or ask any questions they might happen to have. So once something is actually posted on an agenda as a hearing, you should, as a normal course of things, you open the public hearing, you have your conversation about it, we're not going to conclude, we're not going to reach a decision tonight. The board should take a vote to continue that public hearing to a date and time certain. So it shouldn't just be, um, we're going to, we'll, we'll take this up at our, our April meeting, whenever that happens to be. No, it needs to be April 4th at 7 p.m. Because that public hearing notice, as I said, it, it takes on a life of its own once it's been posted. And it gets advertised, it gets put on your website. People show up at the hearing. If I showed up at the hearing tonight and I was told, come back April 4th, then everybody who's interested in that is going to come back on April 4th. They might come back on April 4th and find out it's not going forward tonight. The developer doesn't have all of their, their engineering plans done. We're going to put it off for another two weeks. And they may roll their eyes and grouse about it, but they now know when to come back. If you don't have that continuation from one meeting to the next, if that chain gets broken, then you have to start all over again. You'd have to start all over again if, if it needs to be advertised, if notices need to be sent out to a butters, you have to start that all over again. It also needs to be posted under the open meeting law. So even if you say on Monday night, we're going to continue this discussion on Thursday night, you better make sure that Thursday night also gets posted as a meeting. The other thing, um, you know, notice under the open meeting law does not substitute for any other notice. Um, this is really down there for the land use boards um, because in addition to the open meeting law, planning and zoning operating under the subdivision <coughs> control law or under uh, chapter 40A, they have additional requirements that they have to meet, that their notices have to be posted 14 days before the date of the hearing. So it's all well and good if the town clerk gets the notices 48 hours ahead, but they better make sure that somewhere that notice was also posted 14 days ahead. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Uh, emergency, so we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, it's one thing that I will um, um, add is, you know, that, um, you know, one of the common emergency besides, you know, the grant application that probably isn't the most common, it's usually something like, you know, a water main has burst something catastrophic has just suddenly happened that obviously nobody anticipated. COVID was a perfect example of this. You know, we were getting inundated with calls of, you know, board, the Board of Health needs to address <coughs> this, this spike in, in uh, you know, in, in positive tests. We can't wait 48 hours. We need to do this. Um, you know, COVID kind of taught us in a lot of ways act. Do what you need to do to get the job done. We'll ask for forgiveness later if we have to. Um, similar thing with other types of emergencies. And we're talking about real emergencies, not the shoot, I forgot to post the meeting, but the, oh my God, the water main just burst or something, you know, half of, ta half of town is, uh, doesn't have power. What, whatever the emergency happens to be. If it's a legitimate emergency, you should do as much as you possibly can to comply with the open meeting law. So if that means that you are posting um, an emergency meeting with only eight hours notice, hey, eight hours notice is better than no notice whatsoever. And you can post emergency. And if the emergency is to deal with, you know, that uh, addressing the water main break or addressing the power outage or whatever it happens to be, 
only discuss that topic. That, that doesn't become you know, an opportunity to then have a regular business meeting. You, what I always suggest to folks is when you're going to post an emergency meeting, at the same time, post a regular business meeting as soon as possible as you can within that 48-hour window. So that whatever action you take at the emergency meeting, you can add that to your agenda for your regular meeting that's been properly posted. Take whatever action you need to to ratify any votes or actions taken by the board. And then to the extent that someone out there in, you know, in North Attleboro cyberspace decides to file an open meeting law complaint that you had an emergency meeting and provided no notice, you have effectively cured that by posting the regular meeting and, um, and ratifying the actions taken. Something else I will also say, um, folks have been wondering about the remote participation deadline that is, it was due to expire the end of this month. The latest as of today, the House has passed a bill, the Senate has passed a bill. They still need to work something out between now and March 31st, but right now it is looking like remote participation will be extended for two years. Um, you know, I think the legislature still needs to figure out how do they make this a permanent thing because there are a lot of communities that they don't want to go back to in-person meetings. They kind of have gotten used to it and, it's, um, and it has worked for them. So uh, stay tuned on that one. Okay. So remote meetings. Um, are you folks kind of, are you still doing remote meetings? Are you doing a hybrid? What, what tends to be what you're doing these days? In person, huh? And, and, and that's, that's exactly where, you know, remote participation is kind of where, like, the legislative intent and the practicalities, you know, uh, being in eastern Massachusetts, we don't know how lucky we are with internet connection. You start to go out to Williamsburg, Petersham, you know, your, your internet connection is pretty, pretty spotty at best. Um, and they, it just isn't reliable enough for them to be able to conduct remote meetings. Um, I can tell you there are a lot of communities. Um, I was at a remote, a hybrid meeting last night. The board is all in person. Um, they've uh, purchased owls, which are these like little camera robots like on wheels that if, if the voices are coming from the board, the camera owl turns toward the board. If someone from the audience says something, the owl then turns you know, to your voice to, to pick it up. It's not perfect. It also looks like you're looking at something through a fishbowl lens because everything's on a really weird curve. But it, it, it serves its purpose. You know, for the most part, you can, you can participate. But it also requires that somebody know how to deal with the technology. And um, you know, admitting people or somebody needs to keep their eye on the uh, remote waiting room or know who's raising their hand and who wants to ask a question and signal to the chair, oh, we have somebody in our remote audience who wants to participate. It, it does take a little bit more coordination than it, when we're all physically in a room together. Um, but, you know, maybe two years from now we'll all be old pros at it, who knows. Um, it doesn't sound like you're, you're doing remote meetings anymore, but if they're is a reason, let's suppose, you know, there's another, uh, you know, another variant or another spike and we're all back um, into our, our houses. Um, bear in mind that just like posting a regular meeting, if you're gonna conduct the meeting remotely, you have to put the Zoom link, the Teams link, whatever it is, if it's, if it's telephone number for them to dial in, whether it's a, a website link for them to get into, um, that all needs to be on your meeting notice. Yes? Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. I know we're doing uh, in-person meetings. However, if we know that there's a storm coming, since um, I know the conservation agent, she lives 45 minutes away, 
and she, we just did this in February where she actually did a quick remote meeting. So we posted it, but it still has to post 48 hours, right? Everything. You have to know that you can't do it on Monday and say the storm's happening Tuesday and it's going to be. You know what you could do, and, and I know you can't always, we can't predict weather, right? <laughs> um, but, but even now, where the remote participation deadline was, is, was technically you know, going to expire in two weeks or whatever, three weeks, you know, there are folks who are trying to schedule meetings and hearings and saying, what do I do? Our suggestion is post it both ways. So post it as an in-person meeting, but in the event of you know, inclement weather, in the event that the legislature finally acts to extend the remote participation um, deadline, then the link will be, and here it is. And then what you can also say is, um, please see you know, the Planning and Zoning Department website for updates closer to the date of the, of the meeting. And then you could, you know, you could make a, put a posting out or, or that day saying, you know, due to the snowstorm, tonight's meeting will be fully remote. So that would work for winter. It would. Posting that in notices, so that way you know for either or, you don't have to. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, and then, of course, if you do get back to remote meetings, um, we need to be mindful of the fact that if the technology fails, if something goes down, um, if someone calls you from out there at home and says, we can't, the, we've lost the video feed, we can't hear anybody, we've lost the audio, you need to shut that meeting down. Now, you could shut the meeting down for a short period of time and then hopefully get everything back up and running and get whatever notices you possibly can out to the people that were out there remotely. Um, that is not easy, an easy thing to do. I've, I have been at a meeting where a Zoom link just suddenly went down and uh, one member of the board said, well, we'll send out a new link. Well, you can't send out a new link now because the 20 people at home, how, we, we don't know how to communicate with them to tell them to log back in. Uh, so before you just go ahead and you know, fix the technology in real time, think about the members of your audience who need to know how do they rejoin your meeting if you, if you think you're going to be able to get it back up and running? Um, you know, the, the safer, although probably not the most desirable um, outcome, but the safer outcome would be at the moment the technology glitch is detected, adjourn the meeting and then schedule another meeting and pick it up afterwards. Um, the other thing to bear in mind too, if you happen to be the lucky person who's manning the technology, you know, and admitting people and letting them know when they can speak or whatever it happens to be, um, if for some reason you drop that person, it might be an accident, it might be intentionally because the person is going off on an inappropriate tirade and you decided that was a good time to drop them. That's going to be an open meeting law violation. <laughs> you know, the chair, just like somebody being disruptive in the meeting, the chair can say, you know, that is just not an appropriate discussion. We are not going to have that. I'm not going to entertain that kind of, uh, you know, disparaging remarks to be made about so and so. You, you've been warned. If you, if you if you don't cut it out, we're going to have to, um, you know, ask you to leave the meeting. No different than if we had you know, a police officer come and show up and remove somebody, an unruly person from a meeting. You can remove somebody from a, a, a Zoom or, or a Teams meeting if they are kind of violating, you know, our, our norms of, of procedure. But um, just because you might not like a button that somebody is wearing on their shirt or you don't like the campaign sign that is their backdrop, not really a reason to uh, drop them from the, the meeting. But I'm sure that's never going to happen here, so that'll be fine. Um, we have covered this. Uh, one other thing, just to bear in mind, again, if, we ever go back, if you ever go back to remote meetings, the only other real distinction between an in-person meeting versus a remote meeting is all of the votes that a board takes in a remote meeting 
has to be by roll call vote. And it can't just be all in favor, aye, and can I audibly <coughs> hear you say aye. We need to call off the names of the board members and actually hear if they voted in favor or against. If you have a hybrid where three of your members are in person and two are, are participating remotely, you still need to do a roll call vote for all of your votes. It's only when you finally all get back in person that you can dispense with that. Um, we've talked about technical difficulties. Uh, same thing as far as public participation um, in, in remote meetings. This was something that you probably all experienced early on in the pandemic, the first few Zoom meetings we were all doing, where we'd be like, 10 people all talk at once, and nobody can hear anything or make out anything, and you just want to say to everybody, mute. And then sometimes a host has the ability to mute everybody, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, that, if, if it, we sh we've probably come a long way since then, um, but the chair or the person, again, who's in charge of, of the technology, do not hesitate to say to everybody, would everyone please mute themselves? If you want to speak, there is the raise hand, you know, under the more. You know, those three little dots there, hit that, and you can raise your hand, and so-and-so will, will alert me to the fact that somebody wants to speak. Um, because otherwise, some of these meetings at the very beginning were absolute chaos, you know, versus when we were present in a room, there was a little sense of decorum and this idea that you had to like raise your hand or come up to a podium or be recognized and, and invited to speak. It, it, we, it didn't suddenly become a free for all in Zoom, but it, it felt like that at the very beginning. Um, so that's perfectly fine to mute everyone and remind them of how, if they wish to be recognized, how they can be. There are also some people that, I, I don't know why they do this, they log in on more than one device. And then you wind up with like that, that horrible echo that's going on. It's like, please, can you not log in on your cell phone and your laptop? laptop? Can you just pick one? Um, it's okay to tell them to, to do that as well. Um, but hopefully we've progressed from there. Bless you. So executive session, um, I think we have talked about, you know, stating the purpose with as much information as is necessary. Uh, you do have to also take a roll call vote to go into and come out of executive session. And that, that is the rule regardless of whether you are meeting in person or remotely. Um, only discuss the matter cited. That kind of seems to uh, go without further explanation, but um, I can't tell you how many executive sessions I'm in, and the board will suddenly say, well, while you're here, no, we can't talk about that. <laughs> um, try to keep everybody on topic. And again, all of those you take in executive session are also by roll call. Um, this goes for executive session as well as open session. Maintaining records, exhibits, and documents used in reasonable proximity to the minutes. So this was something that was relatively new uh, when the open meeting law was revised, probably now 10, 12 years ago, whatever it was. Um, your minutes have to include a list of any documents discussed. So if you had a traffic report, you had an engineer's report, you had inspection reports, whatever it happens to be, you have to list those. Because if they were discussed at the board meeting, they were presented to the board, or in any real substantive way, um, it was part of the discussion, then those documents need to be listed on the minutes. That goes for open session as well as executive session. Now, some folks have asked, do I have to attach those documents to the minutes? Because like we were talking about earlier with the meeting notice, if you attach your report, that meeting notice is going to be six pages long. Well, you know, minutes, 30 years ago when I first started in this, war this field, minutes, you know, might be two or three pages at most. It was a couple of sentences. Now minutes are like small transcripts. And then we've got, you know, all of the documents attached. The documents don't have to be attached, but they have to be kept somewhere. So I always recommend that if you've got uh, you know, a meeting notice, 
and you've got all the various reports or whatever it was that might have been distributed to the board members, just kind of keep a master copy somewhere so that you can use that to refer to in your minutes, but also if somebody were to come in and say, I'd like a copy of XYZ that uh, the town council was, you know, I want a copy of the budget that the council was, was discussing last night, you have it. The other thing, just to kind of save yourself, I know that this is a lot of work for us all but you know use your website you can save yourself an awful lot of time and aggravation if you just post your packets and put them out there you know if you if you make a practice of like i said emailing your board members with a copy of the 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 agenda and all of the items the, the documents that they're going to need are going to be discussed if you can email them to your board members you can post them on your website so that you can actually, in addition to, you know, a link that shows like the agenda for the Board of Health meeting, if you want to click on the packet that the Board of Health got so that I can see everything that the board members see, do it. You could also do that with your minutes. When the minutes are finally done, post them on your website. Post any of the, the exhibits or the documents there too. It's going to save you a lot of public records requests or from having to manually go back and like reassemble that record it, it does save a lot of time and aggravation the only warning I have for that though is bear in mind that sometimes there are things that should not be put out there publicly so I'm gonna look at Gail right now because she handles a lot of liquor licenses if you've never had the pleasure of seeing a liquor license application then you don't realize how much financial information goes in there banking information that goes in there absolutely positively none of which should ever be a public record. So for Gail, it would be a pain in the neck for her to put her packets of applications on the website because she'd have to redact an awful lot. But you could probably put 75% of the application on the website so people could look at it. So just bear that in mind that, yeah, that might be an easy fix. And when a public records request comes in, if it's already on your website, you can just refer the requester to the website and you've satisfied the public records request in probably 30 seconds or less but bear in mind any kind of information the assessors you know abatement applications all that yes they're just they're not going to get that um, one other thing about um, executive sessions um, there are there are some executive sessions that carry a little bit more um, procedure than others um, one in particular like purpose number one if you are going to discuss discipline dismissal or any kind of charges or complaints against a public official you can do that in executive session but you have to give that public official written notice 48 hours in advance I don't know how many of you have ever you know, been in that situation. Nine times out of 10, I, I would imagine um, someone would have called me first or you would have called labor counsel first and had that conversation. But that is, um, that is one area where the open meeting law puts a little extra procedure in place. The other thing is um, going into executive session to talk about litigation or litigation strategy. In addition to listing the, the name of the case that you're going to discuss, um, the chair is supposed to make a declaration that having this discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the board's or the town's litigating position. I honestly haven't seen an open meeting law complaint come through that the chair did not make the proper declaration. Um, but, you know, Again, bear that in mind, that would be the best practice to make sure we, we um, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Minutes, so we've talked a little bit about minutes. Um, how many of you in here are responsible for preparing minutes? It's your favorite job, isn't it? <laughs> um, I get asked all the time, what do I have to put in the minutes? How much information, these take so long. Um, you have to obviously put the date, the time, the place, the board that was actually meeting, the members that are present, and as, a, uh, as an aside, you should also include the members that are absent. 
uh, um, just in case there are any members that are absent, and a reasonable summary of what was discussed. So usually the easiest way to do it is kind of follow along from your meeting notice. We're discussing 123 Main Street, that you know rat infestation and the Board of Health inspection. You know, sometimes we can just plug some information in, and that helps. You don't have to list every single member of the public who stood up and, and commented on it or asked a question. Um, you just kind of have to get a, a reasonable flavor. So it's, it's somewhere, between, uh, somewhere between discussion of rat infestation at 123 Main Street and the 20-page verbatim transcript. Somewhere there's that sweet spot in the middle where you get enough information in so that, again, if you, 10 years from now, or your successor 10 years from now, needs to go back and tries to figure out what was going on with 123 Main Street 10 years ago, they could look at the minutes and say, oh, OK. Um, and, and you know, a lot of you might think, does that really matter? Um, I can tell you I've got a, a piece of litigation going on right now involving a 23-year-old subdivision. And I have been trying for over a year to piece together everything that happened on the subdivision using minutes. Because the planning board got permission to destroy the file by the supervisor of public records. So they've got nothing. And we've got just a little bit more than nothing. Um, it, it, you know, it would really help. Because if I had minutes that told me how the board voted, maybe we could resolve the litigation. But we don't have that. So it, it does matter, um, even though it might be frustrating. Excuse me. Yes? So you just made a great point. In the town of North Ottawa, who oversees every department's minutes? So where you're saying 23 years ago, you're in litigation, and you're piecemealing through these minutes, where, who's the MAP or the check and balance so that the streamline makes it more efficient? Te technically, this is kind of a self-policing type of thing. You know, every board is required to approve their minutes either within the next three meetings or 30 days, whichever is longer. If, now I, I can tell you, there are boards, I had one board, hadn't approved any minutes in over a year. You know, they had um, a, a long-term illness of one employee and some turnover. And, and they had lots of very sympathetic excuses for it. But the ultimate responsibility for getting the minutes done rests with the board. So if, if you are a member of the board and you haven't seen any minutes come across any of your agendas for approval in a really long time, it's time to have a conversation with whoever it is that is responsible for preparing those drafts for you. Um, because to my knowledge, there is nobody, you know, like no overarching person. It's not the town clerk. It's not the town manager who's you know, going through and, and checking to see who's up to date on their minutes. Oops, I thought I saw another hand. No, OK. Um, I think we have covered about the, the list of documents. So approval, I, well, I just said this. You have the next three minutes or 30 days, whichever is, you know, is longer, to approve the minutes. Um, yes? So executive session minutes, you could still approve those at the next meeting or the second meeting or however many meetings it happens to be. You could, you could approve them, but the difference is when do they get released to the public? When are they actually a public record? So executive session minutes should always be done separately from your regular session minutes. And your executive session minutes you should look at and say, what was the purpose for the executive session? Is that purpose still ongoing? So if the purpose of the executive session was you know, um, to discuss litigation, and we've now settled that litigation, once the litigation is over, you can go back through all of those executive session minutes, and you can release them to the public. You still could have had the board vote to review and approve them along the way. They just don't get released to the public yet. Um, that's sometimes a distinction that I it, that sometimes falls through the cracks. They say, oh, the board voted to approve them. Well, yes, that's a true statement, but that doesn't mean they're ready to be released to the public. So it's not until the purpose has concluded. So if we have four 18 cases, that's a tax court cases, 
one gets decided, but the other three don't, it's not released because there are three still pending. What you could do, however, is if you got a request for those executive session minutes, I just saying, you know, it sometimes there are there are crazy people that things that happen. Um, if you got a request for your any of your executive session minutes, yeah. the one matter that had been concluded, yeah. that can now be unredacted. Okay. The other three that are still in process remain redacted. Again, absolute pain in the neck, but it, it is technically what we need to do. Um, it, you know, I always recommend that just try to stay as current as you possibly can with your minutes because once you start to fall like two, three months behind, it's kind of hard to recreate it. So, and you might lose board members who are actually present who may have a different recollection of, of how things happened. Um, so we just covered this. Thank you for asking the question about executive session minutes. Um, there is, under uh, the open meeting law, there is the so-called obligation of the chair to periodically review executive session minutes to see whether or not any of them need to be relate, released. Um, there really isn't any rhyme or, or reason to this. Um, you know, whether the chair wants to do this once a month or once every six months, I kind of defer to each board. I think it depends on how many executive sessions do you actually hold and, and, and it, judge accordingly. Yep. Um, however, if you get a request for executive session minutes, you've only got 10 calendar days to respond. So, you know, if it's an executive session where the matter is still ongoing, well, you're not going to release those minutes. You're going to respond by saying the matter is still ongoing and this is not a public record yet. But if they actually happen to ask for those executive sessions for that one thing that has been resolved and you haven't prepared the minutes yet because everything else is still ongoing, you're going to be scrambling in those 10 days to get those executive sessions minutes pulled together and um, out to this person. The enforcement process, well, like I said, many of you are apparently not familiar with it because you're lucky enough to not have uh, those uh, self-appointed open meeting law enforcers amongst you. Um, but the, the process is there is a specific form on the Attorney General Division of Open Government's website. The complainant is actually required to fill out that form to make a complaint. And if they send you an email or they handwrite a letter and say, I'm filing an open meeting law complaint, nope. We don't have to respond to that. You actually have to put the complaint on the Attorney General's form. They file that complaint with the body that they claim has, uh, has violated the open meeting law. That board then has to meet to discuss the open meeting law complaint and discuss a response to the open meeting law complaint. And you only have 14 business days to do so. So holidays, weekends don't count, so that gives us a little bit of wiggle room. But 14 days in the municipal world uh, is, is not always easy unless you've got a regularly scheduled meeting. Um, so I always, when I get an open meeting law complaint, um, I always reach out to the chair of the board to see when is your next meeting, can we get this on the agenda as quickly as possible. It has to be put on the agenda as discussion of open meeting law complaint by and I'm going to disclose one of my frequent flyers, George Harris. Google him under the Division of Open Government and you will see what I spend an awful lot of time doing. Um, you know, that, that, that discussion can either, of the board, it can be in open session and I think naturally we think, well, it's an open meeting law violation, shouldn't we discuss it in open session? Yes, but you can also discuss it in executive session because it is technically a complaint against a public body. And as we were talking earlier about that, you know, exception number one for executive sessions, you could convene an executive session to have um, that discussion. And um, depending upon the nature of the discussion, I've had executive sessions. You know, if, we're gonna, if, the, if the nature of the complaint is the zoning board hasn't approved their minutes for the past year, and that's a violation of the open meeting law, I don't know that we really need to go into executive session to talk about the fact that you're right, we have just not approved our minutes. We've just got to come up with a good excuse um, or sympathetic excuse. Um, 
But if the open meeting law violation is something of a personnel nature, um, you know, or, or litigation related, um, something a little bit more sensitive, you might want to have that discussion in executive session because you don't want to disclose anything inadvertently that you um, haven't discussed publicly before. So that would be something I would just say, you know, if you are faced with it, please contact the town manager's office so he can contact me so we can have a conversation about the right way to do it. Um, that response typically, so what I typically do is after meeting with the board, um, sometimes I might draft a response for the board's meeting if I kind of have a flavor of, of how I think the response should be. Uh, sometimes I have absolutely no idea what the board is going to say, so I meet with them first and then draft the, the, the uh, response afterwards. And then either I send that response into the Attorney General's office, it can come from the chair of the board. It's, uh, there's no right or wrong as long as it gets into the Attorney General's office within that 14 business day period. We have to also attach a copy of the open meeting law complaint to our response. Once it actually goes, and well, once it actually goes into the attorney general's office, um, there will be like an initial automatic email that we all get that says, you know, thank you, we are in receipt of your open meeting law complaint dated X. Um, the attorney general's office will not do anything for 30 days because they are waiting to find out whether the board in its response did the board satisfy the person making complaint? Did the board cure their complaint in any way? Um, lots of times the complainant just wants to make sure you don't do it again. And they're satisfied with a letter that says, going forward, the board will take all steps to make sure it complies with this and blah, blah, blah. But if the complainant is not happy with the board's response, they can then say to the attorney general's office, I want you to further review this. Now that's when the Attorney General may call me, may call the Chair of the Board, may ask for some further questions. Um, you, you might find this hard to believe, but if your meetings are um, recorded like this one is, they watch the recordings. They read all of the minutes. They read, you know, the, the, they go online to your website. Um, and they, because I've, I've had times where I've had conversations with them where I think, wow, we didn't even tell you about that and you, you, you obviously found that on your own. They will, they will investigate it. They will call if they have questions. If they want to know whether the chair reasonably anticipated this, they're going to want to hear from the chair. So that, you know, back and forth will go on for a process of could be three months, six months, whatever it could be. And then eventually the attorney general is going to issue a decision as to whether or not they found you complied with or violated the open meeting law. Um, and 99% of these letters are either no violation or it's a violation, but we accept your response that going forward you won't make this mistake again. Or we accept that the board cured this by putting, it, putting the item back on another meeting agenda and having a full discussion about it, whatever it may be. Nine times out of ten, it's just going to be like a slap on the wrist, you know, just a don't do it again, be more um, mindful of this next time. But every once in a while, that $1,000 intentional violation fine gets issued. It's not often, but if, so if there is a situation where the Attorney General, we've been down this path before, it is the same town, it is the same board, it is the same violation, after a while, there's only so many times that I can be creative in my responses and making up excuses as to why we haven't done what we were supposed to do. Um, and if the Attorney General has given us a few warnings, after a few warnings, they will start to say in their letter, the next time this violation occurs, we may deem this an intentional violation. And then the next time it occurs, don't be surprised if there is a $1,000 fine that's a, that is attached to it. And that always gets the board members upset. But, you know, it's usually after some sort of period of process. So um, 
I know, I know these things are, this seems like an awful lot of, you know, burden and unnecessary paperwork and we don't have time for this, we've got better things to do and blah, blah, blah. It, it's not worth the thousand dollar intentional violation. So, um, I think I have covered all of this on enforcement. The intention, yeah, yes. So cure can be any variety of things. Um, so for example, if, um, if the allegation is we haven't timely approved our minutes, you've had three meetings and it's been more than 30 days and you haven't approved a set of minutes. Well, if you then schedule a meeting for next week and by next week you approve all of those minutes, you've cured the defect. Um, if, if, um, you know, if something was perhaps not put on an agenda with sufficient specificity, one way to cure it is put it on another meeting agenda, make it more specific, instead of saying the health, you know, the health department report, we list all those inspections and all of those properties, whatever it happens to be, you have then cured the defect. And usually, you know, if the Attorney General likes to see that, because then in their response, it's like, well, yes, you violated the law, but you also cured it, and we accept uh -huh. that, and case is closed. So, and that is really it. There is also the process where um, even after the intentional violation, um, if the Attorney General feels that um, a violation is still occurring, that we've really got a bad, bad board that just doesn't want to play by the rules, they can file an action in Superior Court to compel compliance. Um, three registered voters are also able to, stop to file um, a lawsuit in Superior Court to enforce the open meeting law. Um, I'm only aware of one Superior Court um, action that's been taken by three registered voters so far, but um, that doesn't mean there won't be more in the future. So um, I know we are just at like 6.28 and uh, the next one is supposed to start at 6.30, but I'm happy to take any quick last minute questions you might have. Yes. I have a question about the minutes. Um, yes. I understand that they have to be produced within 10 days of a request. How for executive session. Okay. How quickly do minutes have to be produced or created after a meeting? So you have either the next three meetings of that board or 30 days, whichever is longer. No, not to approve them. I'm asking when, when do the minutes When do they have, have to be created? Yeah. Any time in that time frame that allows the board to actually vote to, vote to approve them. So, okay. you know, if you did the minutes the very next day, that's fine. Okay. And I should also mention, the moment those minutes are created, they're a public record, even if they're a draft. So if somebody requested them the next day, stamp draft all over it and hand them out. Yes? Just um, as a director, I sometimes work for interesting public health articles. The chairman would have no idea they're not going to make any deliberation. Does that have to be listed on the agenda? I think that's something you could distribute to the board, like, oh, this is something interesting yeah. that they're doing in Colorado. You know, uh, you could you could distribute that to them just as an FYI, or you could, you know, I, I would I would suggest maybe doing that separate from the meeting, just so that because unless they're actually going to discuss it at a meeting, why mix it up? Okay. okay. No, you could, or you could make it part of your meeting. And just say, oh, it's just an FYI. I was reading about this, and I know this is a similar issue that we're trying to deal with as well. Um, I'm sorry. It just it was the first thing that came to mind. I should come up with something else. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. You are very welcome. Oh, I'm good. How are you? You got to get any permission yet to run? You did. Greg Ellis. How are you? I'm not sure who he is. How are you? He will. He absolutely will. Sweet. <laughs> Thank you. That, oh, very nice to actually meet you in person. I don't think we have met before. How are you?
You are very welcome. Anytime. That is, that is what we exist for, so thank you. Understood. Understood. Hey. Hey, John. Mark. Hello, how are you? I was missing you, I thought. I know, how are you? I'm good. I thought you were crazy, John. You are the sweetest person. No, it was great. Okay, it was I great. Moved some from tonight. Just to drop it in because 
That's a, well, no, that's probably was a good idea, actually. I was I'm like, oh my God, 18 and 50, so I started like. Well, when I saw your email, and I'm like, hmm, as, as Mark uh, Hollow was saying, it's like, there's not going to be enough room in the parking lot for, for, you know, if we don't get out and they get in early enough, I'm like, yeah, that makes perfect sense, so. And I feel bad, you must be No, no, I, no, you know what? I was thinking the same thing, and I'm like, but then, but then the light of COVID, it's like, maybe people don't want to know what you get. So, I am a whole world better. Thank you so much. You are very sweet. Oh my God, yes, I've made it through this without coughing. <laughs> so, life is good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It looks like I don't see anybody out there in the hallway ready to, to head in, so I'll, I will get started. Um, my name is Carolyn Murray from KP Law, and we serve as the town attorney for the town of North Attleboro, and we have for, well, uh, three, maybe four years now. I, I've kind of lost track. Um, I'm assuming most of you or all of you are members of boards or some of you also staff. Maybe show of hands, who's on a board? Okay, so show of hands, who's actually responsible for putting the agenda together and posting meetings and all of that good stuff? Wow, well then I guess we only need to talk to these two people and everybody else can go home, right? <laughs> uh, um, you know, one, one thing that, um, you know, the open meeting law and all this training, you know, this always seems to be like, God, talk about absolutely dry material. I'm gonna spend an hour and a half of my life listening to someone drone on. Um, I will do my very best to make this as interesting as possible as the topic allows. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. Um, I know you can read this presentation. I can stand up here and read it to you. We can both have our eyes glaze over and not really get anything out of it. Um, I, the, you know, there are also, there are no stupid questions. I know folks sometimes feel like in a setting like, well, everybody else knows this, so I'm not going to raise my hand to be the person who asks. I guarantee you that if you have a question, there's probably some other people sitting around you tonight who have the same question. Um, you know, I, I've been practicing or in the municipal law field for almost 30 years. And even today, I had something that some, one of my colleagues pointed out to me, and I had to admit, I have never read the statute that way before in all these years. and so. You know, we learn something new every day, so there really are um, no stupid questions. But also, this training is for your benefit. You know, so get something out of it. So if there's, you know, if there, we, we shouldn't talk about any specific issues or specific, you know, projects or properties or a specific meeting that you actually had. Um, but if there are, you know, situations that as we go through the slides and things that, you, that occur to you and you think, oh, should we maybe have handled that differently? Ask all the hypothetical questions you, you'd like. Um, you know, as I said, this is sometimes kind of a very dry topic, and sometimes it feels like it's a punishment that we even have to be here tonight. Um, and I will say that in the time that we have been um, counsel to North Attleboro, I cannot think of a single open meeting law complaint, certainly not one that I have responded to on behalf of the town. Now, that either means you guys get an A plus because you absolutely positively nailed the open meeting law and never do anything wrong. Or maybe you are one of those lucky communities. Um, you know, I have the pleasure of also serving some other communities where I can tell you that every week I respond to an open meeting law complaint because there's one of those people that lives in that town who is the self-appointed open meeting law police. And no matter how many times we want to say, George, how about you join the board and how about you put the agendas together for them or how about you draft their minutes for them? No, 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 we don't want to do that. We just want to you know, blow through the legal budget by filing open meeting law complaints and, and ticking off members of the board. So um, you know, the reason I'm here tonight is to make sure that you guys continue on the great path of avoiding these open meeting law complaints, or at least knowing how to handle them when we get to them. So um, I'm gonna go through the slides. I have a tendency to cover topics 
and, and then we'll jump over slides. Um, I won't go back and revisit the topic unless I think, oh, there's something that we, you know, that I, that I, I omitted when we were talking about this. Um, so the first thing we always have to put out there, and this goes to my hypothetical discussion, you know, the purpose tonight is that we talk about, you know, the open meeting law and the situation from, say, a, a 30,000 square foot level, uh, 30,000 foot le uh, level, I should say. We're not going to talk about what happened at the assessors on Tuesday night or what happened at the Board of Health or how the town council always does this. Um, we're just going to talk about, you know, hypothetical situations. Um, if there's anything more specific that concerns you after what you hear from me tonight, feel free to ask me privately or um, if you think it really is a serious issue, maybe reach out to the town manager's office and maybe we can have a further conversation about whether you're doing something the right way or should have handled something differently. So let's just start at the very beginning, you know, with the open meeting law. Um, you know, generally these are just referred to as the sunshine laws. You know, the whole idea that we're all supposed to be transparent and in the, in the light of day, everyone's supposed to be able to see what we do and observe. Um, they're pretty uniform throughout the country with a few small differences here and there. But by and large, everything you do as a public official, whether you are appointed, elected, you're a town employee, everything that we do is by and large supposed to be out in the public and accessible to the public. And I, I want to add a, a little footnote here. As I talk to you tonight, in the interest of full disclosure, I was a town employee for 14 years. So I absolutely know what it's like to have to post the meetings, and I know what it's like to have to deal with the minutes and to deal with you know, the, the public or the pressure that you might have sometimes um, to maybe not do it the right way. Um, I, all I can say is I can, I can feel your pain. Uh, I was saying to the earlier session, I remember when the open meeting law notice just was like a, a carbon form that you used to fill out, and maybe one or two of you are old enough like me to remember those carbon forms where all you had to put was the date, time, place, the name of the board, and it, it, that was meeting, you know, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. That's all you had to post. Now we have meeting notices that could be, you know, three pages long depending upon how much information uh, we're required to put there. And it's a pain in the neck, and I know it is, but it it's the law and so if you ever wind up with one of those self-appointed open meeting law enforcers in town they're going to point it out to you so we might as well just do it right as opposed to having to respond to a, a complaint um, we'll also talk just a little bit about the public records law not not specifically I mean that's um, that could be a separate training in and of itself um, but obviously as you know um, the open meeting law and public records law do kind of intersect because anything that is discussed by or presented to or applications that are filed with a board is a public record. So we will talk about how um, the public records law intersects with the open meeting law. So let's just start at the very beginning, you know, and the open meeting law pertains to meetings. And what is a meeting? It's a deliberation among a quorum of a public body to discuss a matter within its jurisdiction. So breaking that down, you need a public body to be subject to the open meeting law. Your town manager is not subject to the open meeting law. Your town manager is just an individual. DPW director, fire chief, police chief, all of those folks are not subject to the open meeting law because they are not part of a board that has to act collectively. If you are part of a board and you act collectively, you have to be careful about who you talk to outside of a public meeting. So if you happen to be a member of the Board of Assessors and you were just, just happened to be in town hall today and while you were in town hall, you ran into another member of the Board of Assessors and in the hallway you start talking about, oh, that abatement application that was discussed Tuesday night. And then that member of, that you ran into in the hallway is on their way into the car in the parking lot, they run into another member, and if it's a five-member board, I'm not sure if your assessors is three or five, but if it's a, okay, so at two, at two we have an open meeting law violation because you have a quorum that's just talked about something that came before the board that night. So if it was the planning board 
and you ran into that third member out in the parking lot, you now have three serial conversations that add it all up. It's a deliberation outside of the open meeting law. This can happen in person. This can happen by telephone. It can happen by email. And most often these days, it's happening by email or on Facebook or on posts and blogs and social media. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the, the takeaway I have for you is if you are a member of a board and you run into another member of your same board, say, hi, how are you? See you next week. And that's about as much as you should be talking about um, publicly. Um, the other thing to, to bear in mind are subcommittees. Now, I was saying a few moments ago that you know, your town manager, police chief, fire chief, et cetera, they're not public bodies, so they're not subject to the open meeting law. So if any of those officials create a subcommittee, that subcommittee is not subject to the open meeting law because the parent that created it is not subject to the open meeting law. But if you are a member of a board and you set up a subcommittee, that subcommittee is subject to the open meeting law because your board is also subject to the open meeting law. So they're gonna have to post their meetings, they're gonna have to take minutes, they're going to have to be careful not to deliberate outside of the confines of a public meeting. So some of the things that we're gonna to cover tonight are the, the legal requirements under the open meeting law. You know, obviously there's the, the notice requirement, timing, location, the level of detail that has to go into the notice, um, purposes for open session versus executive session, and we're going to talk about what has to go into minutes as well. So meeting, as, I, as we were talking about a moment ago, quorum of a public body deliberates on something that comes before them. So um, one example that I guess would give you, you're probably in the middle of or about to start budget season. And let's say you're the Department of Public, you know, Public Works and the town council is going to discuss the, the uh, department's budget that night. Members of the Board of Public Works also want to attend that council meeting. They can do that. You can even have a quorum of the Board of Public Works attend that council meeting. The question is, does the Board of Public Works have to post a meeting or not? And the answer is, it depends. If the Board of Public Works intends to deliberate on anything, or if they think there's a possibility they might deliberate at the council meeting, then they should post a meeting, even though it's gonna be simultaneously overlapping with the council. So for example, if, um, let's suppose the, the um, Public Works budget is calling for a $2 million increase for snow removal purposes or whatever, and the council starts saying $2 million. Well, we don't have $2 million. We'd have to do an override. We can't, we can't possibly do this. If the Board of Public Works has actually posted a meeting, and if they wanted to reduce that $2 million to half a million dollars or $1 million, or they wanted to tweak it in some way, they could, if they posted a meeting, you know, confer amongst each other and say, they could even take a vote. They could say, you know, well, we're, we're um, you know, we appreciate the work that the council has to do, but we really feel that we need $2 million to get this project done or to make those repairs. That's okay if the, if the board has posted the meeting. If the Board of Public Works did not post it, or we don't know whether we're gonna get a quorum of the Board of Public Works to actually show up to the council meeting, my suggestion is don't all sit together shoulder to shoulder in the front row. Don't all sit together in the back row. Don't cluster in the corner of the room whispering um, where anybody might start to think, aha, we've now got a quorum of the Board of Public Works. They're over there talking. They must be deliberating about something that they should be talking about in a public meeting. For all we know, they're, they're talking about whether or not they like the changes that the Red Sox made in the off season. I don't know, but there might be somebody out there who thinks they're talking about something that you know, is a matter that has to come before the board. So refrain from that. If you're not gonna post your meeting, sit apart in, that, in the audience when you get up to actually uh, answer any questions or to address any questions that the council might have. It's perfectly fine to identify yourself as you know, a member of the Board of Public Works, but I would say that if the board hasn't specifically taken a vote 
on an item, then you should not represent that you are speaking for the board. So instead, you should stand up and just say, I'm, I'm Susan Smith, I'm a member of the Board of Public Works, but I am speaking to the council, I want to address that council just as an individual, not on behalf of the full board. Um, the term meeting does not include attendance by a quorum of at a public or private gathering or social event, provided the members do not deliberate. I, yes? I'm sorry, I, I have a question about quorum in mm -hmm. terms of how boards can fluctuate in terms of membership. So is there a point at which a board should designate, like, this is our quorum for this month? Like, is there something public that we need to report every time we have a meeting that we have reached quorum? So a quorum, as a, as a general rule, is always going to be a majority of your board unless you have a bylaw or a charter provision that provides otherwise. Um, so if you've got a five-member board, it's always going to be three. Um, it, even though you might have two people who maybe have a vacancy and maybe someone is sick one month, um, three is still your quorum to be able to do any business. You know, your quorum doesn't change. Like if, if you have two vacancies on your board, your, your quorum doesn't become two out of a three-member board. It is still a five-member board unless you have a bylaw that sets a lower quorum. Okay. Um, I get a lot of questions about chance social events. You know, not just we show up at a meeting of another board, but it's a retirement party. And we all want to go to, you know, the chief's retirement party. But we're going to have a quorum of our various boards there. That's perfectly fine. You do not have to post that as a meeting. But just like I said, you don't want to be seen in the corner with a quorum of your board members whispering or looking like you might be deliberating about something. If you're at a retirement party, wish the chief well in retirement and, and keep the conversation about anything but business that is supposed to come before the board. And if anybody approaches you and says, oh, I really wanted to talk with you about Tuesday night, you say, Good, I'll see you Tuesday night. So deliberation um, can be a communication, oral or written, through any medium. So this is, you communicate to somebody by talking to them, a telephone call, an email, social media, Facebook posting, whatever it happens to be, is a communication. But if it is between and among a quorum of the board, on something coming before the board, that is a deliberation. That is something that should be confined to a posted meeting. Um, so the only time that it is OK for a quorum or even the, the entirety of a board to be copied on um, a communication, or you know, this usually comes up in the context of email, is you can email everybody about scheduling. Hey, everyone, we're going to have a snowstorm on Tuesday night. We'd like to move our meeting to Thursday. Can you make it? Um, you could, um, you can distribute the meeting agenda to all members of your board, and that is not a violation of the open meeting law. You can also distribute packets, um, you know, a uh, traffic report, engineering plans, uh, the latest copy of the budget, whatever it is that the board is going to be discussing at your meeting next week. You can distribute all of that to all members of the board in a single email. That's not a violation of the open meeting law. Those are the only three exceptions when you can communicate with the entire board or a quorum of the board. So it's perfectly fine to say, here's the agenda for Tuesday night. Please note we're starting at 6.30 as opposed to 7. That's fine. It's also fine to say, and um, we just got that traffic report in for um, you know, the casino in Plain Ridge and how it's going to, Plainville and how it's going to into, you know, interact with our traffic patterns. That's all perfectly fine to distribute to your entire board. However, if you then continue on to say, and based on the traffic report, there's no way in the world I would ever vote for this project. You've now expressed an opinion. That's a violation of the open meeting law. You cannot do that. I've had people who have said to me, but I was the only one who sent it out, and no one responded. Doesn't matter. The, per the rest of your board doesn't need to respond. It is enough that the board got that communication, 
understands where you're coming from now on a particular issue, and that's something that should have been discussed uh, publicly. Uh, avoiding the appearance of a deliberation, like I said, this is the, um, you know, the issue I said of like, you know, being seen whispering off in the, the corner. But, but also another way that it can appear that the board might be deliberating. And, and let me just ask for a show of hands. How many of your boards prohibit use of cell phones during your board meetings? How many of you have been at a board meeting where you see another member of the board texting on their phone? Now, maybe they're ordering pizza for, for the pickup on the way home. Maybe they're telling their, chi their kid, do your homework. <laughs> um, or maybe they're texting the other member at the end of the board to say, I'm voting no, how about you? That's a deliberation that is not being openly discussed to the public. Um, so you might want to consider whether or not, um, you know, do you implement some kind of a rule, the board, where that kind of communication is not happening? Or, or in the, the, the old days, as I say, where, where you used to suddenly like see a piece of paper being passed, like a note, like you're in study hall, being passed from one member to another. I don't know what the note necessarily says, but you know, it, it certainly looks suspicious. Yes, sir. survey or of a report or something, and you want to discuss it at the future meeting, but you're working with other members of the committee to develop it. How do you handle that situation? If it's just you plus one other member, and that's not a quorum of your board, that's OK. That other member can't then go have a meeting and sit with a third member if that now constitute, constitutes a quorum. It's, it makes it more difficult. It definitely does. This, this comes up a lot um, in like an evaluation process where a board wants to evaluate their department head. And there are more open meeting law violations that stum, stem from an evaluation process than you can imagine because what is an evaluation? It is every individual board member's opinion of a particular person. And now, you know, do we if we distribute that before the meeting, you've just distributed your opinion to others. Um, you know, that one way that you might be able to get around like that collaborative drafting is if you make that draft public at the same time that you share it with your other board member. But you may not want to do that. Because putting that out there in the public realm might just, you know, that might be like kicking the, the proverbial hornet's nest, and maybe, maybe we don't want to go there just yet. Um, so if that's the case, you've got to limit your, who you talk to uh, to less than a quorum or limit your discussions to being within a public meeting. Did you? Uh, did I, no? OK. No, that's OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> Site visits are another uh, thing that I get an awful lot of questions about. Usually this comes up with the, the assessors or, or like the land use boards where we want to go to a particular property and we want to really get a sense of, you know, a little bit more familiarity with what the project is proposing. Um, site visits either are or are not a meeting and it depends on how you treat it. So. Just like you can't deliberate, if you're going to go to a, if, if, if all of the board members on Saturday morning are going to meet at a particular property and you're going to walk the site and you're going to get your bearings, more or less. You know, you, you might show up with, with the plans or the application and you want to just get a sense of, okay, so this is where the existing building is, that's where the new access would be, that's where they're proposing the addition. That kind of like general getting familiar with the site type of a site visit, that's perfectly fine. If you go further than that, it's now a deliberation. So if a couple of board members are all sort of milling about looking at their set of plans and they're saying, oh, that's where they want to put the addition? I don't know why they want to put the addition there. I'd suggest they move it about 25 feet over here and then you, you won't have all the objections from that neighbor. 
Now you're, engage, you're expressing an opinion, you're engaging in a deliberation. Now that absolutely should have been done in the context of a meeting. So, um, you know, I generally advise if you're going to have a site visit and you think there is a possibility that there might be some deliberation post. If you think you can all show up for the site visit and not deliberate, then go ahead. Just, it, you just go ahead and, and meet there. It doesn't need to be posted. A couple of um, caveats, though. If you do decide to post the meeting, so one thing is that um, our meetings are also are supposed to be accessible to the public, meaning accessible to anybody who might have any kind of disability or a mobility or any kind of an impairment. So if you're going to post a meeting, and that meeting is going to be at a construction site, you might want to think long and hard about whether that really is an appropriate site to uh, invite the public to attend. Or uh, I used the example, I, I once went to a site visit. It had to do with an earth removal permit where a developer had literally cut like right off the, into the edge of a hill, a pretty substantial hill that had just been removed. And we were going to have a site visit there. And the chair of the board is on crutches. Like, there's no way that the chair of the board can even get around this site other than to see it from his car. Um, you know, if that is a possibility that people are actually not going to be able to have meaningful access to the site, don't post it as a meeting. The other thing is, you're having that meeting on private property. Now, that's perfectly fine to have a meeting on private property. We don't have to always have our meetings in a public building. But if you're going to have that meeting on private property, you need the permission of the property owner to be there. And now I've seen plenty of applicants who will be at a meeting and they will say to the board, you want to come see the site? Walk the site with me. I'll be there Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. I'll have coffee and donuts. Everybody can come walk the site. Everyone can come walk the site or just the board members can come walk the site. Because if I post it as a meeting, that means that the abutter across the street who's dead set against this, uh, this project has a right to come onto your property too and walk around with all of us. So consider those things. And that might make you decide, let's not post this as a meeting. Let's just get our, get the, get our bearings, get our lay of the land. And then what I suggest you do is when you have your next regularly scheduled meeting, that the board members report, we went to the site on you know, Saturday at 9 o'clock. It was attended by you know, all members of the board, whatever it is. Um, it ended at 9.30, and we just uh, we walked the site to get a sense of existing conditions and the uh, proposal uh, for the you know, addition project, whatever it happens to be, so that those who weren't able to be there get a sense of, okay, you know, the board did go. What did they see? What did they observe? Um, and that, that's sufficient. Um, I think I covered the rest of that, so we can skip on to the next one. So email. Um, I covered this a little bit when we are talking about, you know, the three things that you can email, scheduling, um, agendas, and materials. But um, you know, we always say, beware of the reply all. You know, it happens to all of us, myself included. You suddenly hit that reply all and go, oh, didn't mean to do that. Um, well, let's just hope that that reply all was just, have a good weekend. <laughs> you know, it wasn't something more substantive um, so that you make sure that you are not engaging in any way with your board members. Um, and obviously any other unintended uh, recipients who might be copied on that email. You know, lots of times today um, I, I get copied on a lot of meeting agendas for some of the towns I work with. And this email must have like 50 people on it because everybody in town has requested copies of these agendas just because, I don't know, they're frequent flyers and they like to go to those board meetings, I don't know. Um, so you never know sometimes who you're responding to. So be careful of that. Social media. Um, so uh, in the interest of full disclosure, oh, yes, sir. One of the problems that we've had in the past is about minutes. And I know you haven't really gone over in depth about minutes. 
but a lot of the times well, people uh, will want to go to the town clerk's office and get the minutes of a meeting and that type of thing. I know that a lot has changed because we changed our form of government. We've gone from basically a town administrator RTM form of government uh, to what we have now. Has the rules changed any way whatsoever when it comes to minutes with the new form of government? Uh, you know, so that's my question there. The, the answer to your question is yes, the rules have changed, but not because you changed your form of government. Um, I want to say about 12 years ago, the open meeting law kind of got an overhaul. Um, and at that time, there were some changes made to minutes. Um, and I promise you, I will cover that. Okay. All right? All right. Um, so social media. Um, I will disclose that I am one of those people who absolutely positively does not engage in social media. I happen to hold the opinion that my life is not that exciting. My life isn't that exciting. Why should I be posting pictures of my vacation? And I don't really have time to look at your pictures of your vacation. So, you know, why well, I'm, you know, and it drives my friends and my family members crazy because they'll say, well, if you were on Facebook, you'd know. Um, I know that social media is a very effective tool for towns to use to communicate with folks. But the same rules still apply. So if you find yourself looking at a Facebook posting or you're in a blog or a chat room or wherever you happen to be and somebody posts something and it's a complete, completely inaccurate, it might even be absolutely inflammatory, you know, whatever it is, and you, and you feel like I've, I've got to jump in here and I've got to set the record straight. And you jump in and you, you know, you may identify yourself, or it might be just obvious who you are. Uh, you jump in and you say, that's not correct, blah, 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 and you start engaging. Well, number one, you don't always know when you post that reply. You don't always know who's seeing that or who, who, who that's going to out there. It may very well be going to a couple others of your fellow board members and so that one posting has now constituted an open meeting law violation. Or it may very well be that you respond, you're responding to, you know, the, I don't know, the North, 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 uh, the North Attleboro's, you know, uh, a neighborhood association or something like that. Well, um, so you might be weighing in on an issue there and you, you realize that none of your other board members are a member of that neighborhood association. So you post something, but then later in the day, another board member posts something. And then later in the day, another board member posts something. And now we've got this great digital footprint of your violation of the open meeting law. Um, don't do it, don't do it. I know it is really hard to resist and easy for me to say since I don't, but resist the temptation to jump into the fray in any sort of electronic or digital way. If you are gonna jump in, jump in and say something like, you know what, I am glad that this is generating such debate and I really hope that all of you are going to be at the meeting on Tuesday night when you know, the school committee is going to discuss the new school project. Whatever it happens to be. That, that way you kind of invite the conversation into the public meeting session and you haven't done anything to express your opinion, you're not correcting facts, um, you're not violating the open meeting law. You know, that, this seems to be an area that is growing a little bit more in terms of the, the violations that, that we're seeing. So try to refrain from that. Yes? So what, in that social media example, what, is it the, is it the, the message getting to the other members of the board that constitutes the violation? That's when you get like a form or whatever? Or the, is that what it, it, is? it can be the message, but also it tends to go to more of the content. So like I said, if you if you were to post, I really, we, we certainly understand that this is um, you know a very uh, a hot topic or a controversial topic, and we welcome all of you to come to the meeting on Tuesday night and let the board members know how you feel. That's fine. You haven't expressed an opinion, you haven't weighed in, you haven't tried to you know, correct the, the, the record or anything like that, 
that's fine. But there are times when, when a board member feels like, look, they've got this just totally wrong. Um, you know, they've, they've uh, and, and you can't resist the temptation to start to say, you know, first and foremost, the project isn't 20 million, it's 2 million. Secondly, we're not going to tear down, you know, that school, we're gonna put an addition on you. When you start actually getting into the, the nuts and bolts of the substance of it, you're deliberating. You're doing something that, that should be discussed before your board as a whole. So if other members of the board now jump into that, you know, that, that string or that, that chat room, that's where the violation comes in. Was there another hand? Yeah. Um, okay, so in a, in a case like a, a board has a Facebook page and they share an event that another town has that's like them, is that a violation of that? Because that's expressing like interest in what they're doing or supporting another town in their events. Is that a problem? I don't think that's a problem. If, if you're going to say, like, hey, you know, it's, um, it's May 1st and the farmer's market is going to open up again now that, you know, spring is finally here and, um, you know, something, something like that, getting the message out that's, there, that's fine. Um, or even if it is something in a, an, you know, the, the you know, Attleboro is going to have a flu clinic and it's open to any residents of North Attleboro. That's fine. That's like strictly strictly messaging to get it out there. Um, that I kind of consider a lot of boards will put um, announcements you know, on, on the agenda and then we have no idea what anybody's gonna say but we go right down the line and we hear about you know, every kind of fundraiser, the Girl Scouts are selling cookies, the Boy Scouts will be doing this. You know, we go right on down the line. Um, I think using social media to advertise things like that is fine. It's when you know you've got something pending before you that any kind of discussion about that project before a vote has been taken should only take place in a public meeting. Yes, sir. So, so the two follow-ups. Um, if someone, is, someone posts something in, on a message on a Facebook group, and like you were saying, is completely wrong. And the relevant department has information on the town webpage with the correct information. And I post a link saying, go to this webpage and read that for more information. Would that be considered deliberation? I think that's okay. I think that's fine. Okay. Stopping at that. Not, st not starting with, you people are way off base and don't know what you're talking about see the link that's on the police chief's website or, or whatever. So just say go here for more information. Yeah, I, I would say that, yeah. The, for more information, I would consider to be similar to that, that email distributing the agenda and, and the um, you know, materials that'll be reviewed. I think that's fine. Okay, so now sort of part two to that. Mm -hmm. If people are talking about a vote, something that has already been voted on and they are wrong, what they're saying, and I then say, well, no, what we actually voted on was this. And would that be a potential violation? It's already been voted on. If it's already done in the past, not likely to come back or not, you know, let's suppose, you know, like I, I, I'll, I'll pick on, say, the planning board. You know, the planning board is, has voted. They've issued the special permit. They're done. If it's something, though, that kind of has some subparts to it, you know, like um, a school building project, you might have one meeting where you vote uh, to, to send in a, a, you know, a statement of interest. And then we get further on down in the process, and now we're looking at feasibility studies and options, and do we like option A or option B, new school or addition, whatever. If it is something in that type of, like, it's, it's still on a continuum, and, and still is going to have to come back to your board for further action, then I would refrain from anything more than, for more information, please, you know, please go to this, this link. Um, because that, even talking about, well, this is what the board voted. I mean, you could, you could certainly say in that example I just gave, um, to be clear, the only thing the board has done is voted to support um, submitting a statement of interest. 
That would be perfectly fine and factual. They could go to the minutes. They could look at that. Um, I don't think I would then say it's going to come back to us for further discussion of the options in another three to six months. I think I would keep it very, very short and sweet. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Was there one other hand? Nope. Okay. Great. Um, so let's see. I think we have covered email, instant post, uh, instant messaging. I don't even know if anybody does instant messaging anymore. Um, but now it's just all under the the rubric of social media. So the meeting notices. Um, you have to post everything 48 hours in advance. That excludes Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. For those of you who are old enough like me to remember when it didn't exclude Saturdays and Sundays and legal holidays, you know, it's, it still is an adjustment. Um, so if Monday is a holiday, you've got to post a Tuesday meeting on Thursday. I can't tell you how many times people screw that up because they forget about the Monday holiday and they're like, oh, well, no, 48 hours, um, you've missed the deadline. Um, you have to state the date, the time, the place of the meeting. You also have to put every, list everything that the chair reasonably anticipates will be discussed 48 hours in advance. So um, talk, breaking that down a little bit more. The topics have to be sufficiently specific. So the example I, I always give is you look at a particular agenda and it might say town manager's report, health director's report, superintendent's report. Report about what? Do you have any idea what any of those people are going to talk about? Me either. But I can tell you it's probably on 20 meeting notices for meetings that are going on right now throughout the state. Those are not sufficiently specific agenda descriptions. Yes, ma'am. What is this about executive session? It just says that there will be executive session to discuss contracts that otherwise wouldn't happen. I, 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 will, I will talk about that in, in just a minute, but you are supposed to put as much information on that meeting notice, including the executive session, as you possibly can. So if you are the superintendent, and you know that you're going to talk about the budget, or you're going to talk about plans for moving the fifth grade from the elementary schools up to the middle schools, whatever it happens to be. Anything that you know is going to be discussed should be listed under the superintendent's report. If now, now the, the, the obligation for this is what does the chair reasonably anticipate 48 hours in advance? And I suppose the chair could say, I had no idea what the town manager was really going to discuss. I, I, sometimes that works. And sometimes I get a call from the attorney general that says, really? Your chair really didn't have a conversation with the, you know, the town manager before that meeting was posted to know that this topic was going to be discussed? Really? That's what they tell me, okay. Um, but the inference is there, that if, if, you, if you know, and, and not only that, but if the town managers or the superintendents or the health director, whoever it happens to be, if their report is actually you know, emailed to all the board members on Friday morning as part of a packet of materials, then you know what's gonna be discussed. So why not list some of those topics and put it on the agenda avoid any kind of, um, of a violation because they do come up. Yes. What if that town manager report is posted every meeting? Like it's posted on the website. You still need to put it on the agenda? Is it, is it posted in advance? That day, you know, it's about 48 hours. What, what, the, um, what the AG would likely say in that instance is if the town managers or the superintendent's report is made public, at the same time that it's distributed to whatever board it's going to. That would be fine. Okay, because so, we usually print, send it out on Monday, I post it and then we pass it out at the meeting so they don't get it before. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. That's fine, but I would suggest, you know, if, if there is, you know, let's suppose that the town manager is making that report to the town council and we're talking about the town council's meeting notice, I would say in the town manager's report, 
you might even want to say, um, see report attached here too. You know, report to town manager dated March 7th and, and just attach it, you could do that. In the earlier session, um, we had someone from the health department who was like, do you have any idea what I'd be putting under the health director's report? All of the inspections, all of the licenses, all of this, all of that. I said, I know, don't shoot the messenger. Um, there was actually um, an open meeting law violation, I think it was the town of Carver. Um, they were renewing earth removal permits. And I guess in Carver, there were a lot of earth removal permits that particular year. And all they put on the agenda was renewal of earth removal permits. And someone filed a complaint, and the AG said, you should have listed every property and like the name of like the business or the property owner so that people know where these earth removal permits are going to be issued. It, it's a lot. You know, I think of, I think of um, liquor licenses. You know, the end of the year when we're renewing all of our liquor licenses or common victuallers licenses, you think, oh my God, you know, that list is so long. Attach the list to the meeting notice and then, then you know, you've, you've satisfied the, uh, the requirement. Um, the other thing that, uh, that usually gets the Attorney General's ire is generic topics like old and new business. <laughs> What is old and new business? It's fine if you use the heading old business and then you, you proceed to list things that are carryovers from a prior meeting and then new business to indicate you know, the new items, but list whatever the old business and new business is. Don't just throw that out there. Um, you should always, when you're putting the, agenda, the meeting notices together and the agendas together, you should always look at it from the standpoint of if somebody sitting at home hopped on the website or, or looked at this, would they know what we're going to talk about? And if they really, and if they have been waiting for a meeting to discuss a rat infestation at 123 Main Street, they're looking for 123 Main Street and rat infestation to show up on an agenda. And if they don't see it, they're going to be a little annoyed that they missed out on that, that discussion because they wanted to participate. So that's a, a prime example of someone who might file a complaint. Um, other some suggestions based on some attorney general uh, opinions we've seen, don't use acronyms or abbreviations. Um, you know, some common ones I, I have seen, um, you know, application to MSBA. Well, some of us might know that as the Mass State Building Authority, but there might be some others out there who have no idea what the MSBA is. Or I've seen um, contract negotiations with AFSCME. It's entirely possible that someone out there might not know what AFSME stands for. Spell those things out when, um, when you can. Um, executive sessions, now, so to go to your question. Um, if you're going to have an executive session, your agenda item should say executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, purpose number, and this is where the important piece of information is. And, um, I am going to send to you, Karen, we have a, a cheat sheet of I all the purposes. That. Okay. Yeah. Um, I asked at the, at the earlier session and they said they didn't have it. I'm like, I'm going to make sure we get some. I'll send that to everyone tomorrow. Okay, perfect. Um, we've, we usually put out some, uh, you know, a cheat sheet, a one page that you can keep handy to pull out reasons for an executive session so that you don't have to always, you know, search for it online or, or call me or whatever the case may be. But you need to sp state the purpose. So if you're going to discuss pending litigation, for example, it's always going to be purpose number three. And you then also have to state as much additional information as is possible without disclosing too much information or without like, defeating the purpose of the executive session. Okay? So for example, um, if the town is going to go in, you know, Nine times out of ten, sadly, we're getting sued. We rarely sue. But every once in a while, the town has a reason to bring a lawsuit against another party. Well, if a board needs to go into executive session to decide should we or should we not follow a, file a lawsuit, that's absolutely a basis for executive session. We may or may not want to disclose the name of the other party because, you know, there might be a reason why we 
don't want to advertise that just yet, that we're thinking about suing somebody. So if, if there is a legitimate reason why we would not want to include that on the agenda, that's fine. If there's no reason in the world not to include it on the agenda, then put it on the agenda. Put the, you know, if it's a developer, or you know, put, put the developer and, and related to you know, the property that might be at issue. Um, as much as we possibly can. Now, there's some exceptions to that, obviously. Um, for example, purpose number one under executive session has to do with charges, complaints, discipline, or any um, complaints against a public official or an employee. So if someone has made a complaint against um, you know, a health director, let's just say, um, alleging that you know the health director is taking bribes during inspections. I'm sure that absolutely never happens, but just to give you an example. Um, the Board of Health could have an executive session. They have to give notice to the health director 48 hours prior in writing that we've, we're going to discuss this complaint that we've received about you, and oh, here is a copy of the complaint, or we have to at least summarize the complaint and the health director has a right to attend that executive session, to show up with counsel, um, to request, they, they, they are allowed to speak on their own behalf, and they also have the right to request that that discussion take place in open session if they choose. So if you've got anything that ever sort of rises to a complaint or something of, of a personnel nature, I strongly suggest reach out to the town manager's office so they can get in touch with me and we can make sure that, that you do it right. Um, other uh, executive session examples. We might go into, um, into executive session because we're going to negotiate, uh, we're going to strategize about negotiating a contract with our DPW director. And we may actually want to negotiate with our DPW director. Both of those things can be done in executive session. But you have to put, for the executive session, con you know, uh, contract negotiation strategies and contract negotiations with DPW director. You have to identify the, the person or the position um, that you're negotiating with. Um, so just putting something, if you just have contract negotiations on the agenda, not good enough. If you say you're gonna discuss personnel matters, not good enough. Um, you know, you've gotta be as specific as you possibly can, but like I said, still bearing in mind that you might need to protect um, some other interest. So at the earlier session, we had some folks from the assessor's office. Abatement applications are not something that, are, that, is, that is public record. So if they go into executive session to discuss you know, uh, an abatement application, whether or not they want to grant an abatement, um, they don't need to disclose as much information as, say, another board might have to on another topic. Or um, we might have a situation where um, we're looking to make a hiring decision. And we've had this person um, undergo a, a criminal background check. And maybe that criminal background check comes back and we're a little concerned that mm, maybe, maybe we shouldn't hire to make an offer of employment to this person. Maybe I'm not quite sure. Maybe there's something that we can look at and say, oh, you know, it was when they were in college who didn't who didn't have a, a little minor indiscretion on their record you know, when they were young and, and stupid, I guess, would be the answer. Um, you can go into executive session to discuss um, someone's, uh, someone's quarry background, but you're not gonna put on the agenda discussion of criminal history record related to John Smith, because then everybody in the world knows that John Smith's got a criminal record. So there are some exceptions to the specificity um, and if you ever have any questions, I, like, I would just suggest please find a way to reach out to us to make sure we aren't saying too much and we aren't saying too little. The other thing, um, if you're just going to have an executive session, um, you still have to post the meeting and you have to convene your meeting in open session first and then you need to vote to go into executive session. There are some communities that I've seen where they will post an executive session and then they will post an open session separately. 
and the executive session might be at 6.30, the open session is at 7. I don't understand why they do that, because they could just post one meeting to begin at 6.30. The meeting notice could simply say, you know, call meeting to order, next thing on the agenda is executive session, and then the next thing on the agenda can be all the matters that will be discussed in open session when they come out of executive session. Um, but if you, the only thing that is going to be on your agenda is an executive session, you still have to call the meeting to order in open session. So list that on your agenda as well. Um, matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair. We talked about this a little bit earlier um, where it, it does sound a little silly, but like I said, I have had instances where you know, the, the attorney general is really looking at whether or not they believe did the, did the chair not reasonably anticipate that something was going to be discussed such that it should have been added to your meeting notice? Um, you know, if, what happens if you posted your meeting and then something comes up? Revise the, revise the meeting notice. That's perfectly fine. You can revise the meeting notice as many times as you need to add something to it. When you add, um, when you post a revision, I recommend that you make it obvious in some way what the revision is so that someone doesn't need to read through the whole thing and compare. Yes, sir? How long do you have? I know you have to post the meeting. 48 hours, how, how many, how, when can, what's the stop where you can't make any more changes to the agenda? There isn't any outer, you know, there isn't any limit at which you can't do it. Okay. You know, you can't make any further revisions. Um, but that being said, I don't think you want to post a revised meeting notice at 6.59 for 7 o'clock. So, so some reasonable discretion does come into it. But it may also be um, that at 6.59, somebody suddenly makes you aware of something that is time sensitive and you need to act on. <laughs> so you might decide at 6.59, well, as crazy as this is, I'm going to add this to the agenda. Um, I realize maybe no one out there is going to see this before I do it. But um, then when you actually get to that item on the agenda, you can say, look, this is a very late addition to the agenda. Um, it could be that somebody has, I don't know, maybe we have to award a contract before the bids expire tomorrow, and this is our absolute last day, or there's a deadline, a grant application is due, whatever it happens to be, you can take that up, even without revising your agenda. You could take it up as a matter that the chair did not reasonably anticipate 48 hours in advance. The question really becomes, is it something that you have to act on that night, or is it something that could wait for another scheduled meeting. If it can wait, wait. If you can make an argument that it was pressing and we had to deal with it, <clears throat> add it to your agenda. And you can flat out say, um, when you get to that, you can let the, the public know, um, the next topic is not on our agenda because it was not known by the chair 48 hours in advance, but it is something that's time sensitive and um, we think it's in the town's best interest that we do take this up tonight. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So I'm having like an existential crisis as I listen to this. So we... Deep breaths. Deep yeah. Breaths. Okay. So, <laughs> so you have an agenda. One person makes the agenda, but you, you can't get any feedback from anyone else on your board about what needs to be on the agenda because that would be a violation of open meeting laws, right? And so then... Um, Anytime you have a conversation with more than one person, you can't have a conversation about what you may have on the agenda be unless that's in a public space. Is that, am I right so far? Generally, yes. And that sounds really bad when it gets described that way. And, and that, <laughs> yes. But I mean, that's yeah. what we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? So how do we ever get anything done? Well, you know, they're, they're not, they're, 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 this is really where staff comes in, right? Uh -huh. Because nine times out of ten, it's a staff person who is putting that agenda together. 
they might have some discussion or input from the chair, but most of the time it's really a staff person who's been keeping track of everything. You know, these were, these were some matters that we continued from our last meeting, so guess what, I'm gonna put them on the agenda for this meeting because we continued them to, to tonight. I don't need to confer with the chair or, or need to get you know, the consent of the chair to put it on the agenda. This is what the board voted to do. Or if you had, you know, a particular board member might say, let's say for example, someone um, brings up an issue under public comment. And, um, a, you know, the, the one member of the board then says, you know, Mr., uh, says to the chair, I really think that that is a topic that is worthy of a full board discussion and I could make a motion or I could make a request that the board take this up at their, you know, their meeting in two weeks. If, the, if they're, everyone agrees or there's no pushback to that, put it on the agenda for that, for that next meeting. And whether that's coming from the chair or whether that's coming from the staff person, I don't think we need to have a lot of you know, back and forth about it. Um, the other thing is that board members can use their staff person. So if you're outside of a board meeting and you know, member you know, number two emails you as a department head and says, I'd really like this to be added to the agenda. Can you ask the chair if we could put it on for this, this month or next month, whatever it is? You can then become the conduit for that conversation because you're not subject to the open meeting law. It's just the board members. Yes? They don't have a staff. When the cultural council, they don't have a staff. Cable mm -hmm. advisory doesn't have, you know, so mm -hmm. I've always been the in-between, but I've kind of let them do it. So are you saying I should help with all of the if, other? If you don't have staff, then, the, then it becomes more of a burden to the chair. But again, could you confer with the vice chair in, in putting agenda items together? Because maybe the chair, you know, we don't all have perfect recall. Um, so maybe there are certain things that the vice chair might look at and say, ah, we promised that we would discuss this again. Or we told you know, the community preservation committee that we would make a recommendation to them for their next meeting. That's, that's okay if that's not a quorum of the commission. Thanks. Sure. Is there one other hand? No? Okay. Um, so some practical considerations on the posting notice. Um, you know, they, the time, uh, the reason we have to file these things with the, with the town clerk, 48 hours, is the town clerk is obligated to put that digital stamp on it so we know exactly when the meeting notice was posted and when any revisions were posted. Those come in very handy when defending an open meeting law complaint. Um, a meeting may not be continued from one night to the next unless it's properly posted under the open meeting law. At the last um, session, I had a question that really had to do with public hearings as distinct from public meetings. You know, all meetings of public bodies are open to the public, but the public does not have a right to participate. They have a right to be present, they have a right to observe, but they don't have a right to engage unless it's a public hearing. So there's a distinction there that if you're required by statute charter or bylaw to, to have a public hearing on a particular matter, then you have to open it up to public comment. And that's one of the reasons why we always have the, you know, a motion to open the public hearing, a motion to close the public hearing so that we have signaled to the public, your window for speaking is now open, your window is now closed. Now, let's suppose we have a public hearing. It opens up on Monday night. We have an hour's worth of debate. We have to move on to other things on the agenda. There's a motion to continue. You have to continue that hearing to a specific date and time. If you just say, we should continue this to another, you know, to another night, and we never say what that other night is, that hearing has like, effectively died and it would have to be re-advertised and reposted all over again. That really ticks applicants off because they suddenly start saying, well, who's paying for that? That wasn't my fault. Um, so you always want to continue hearing to, you know, the 
April 17th meeting at 6 p.m. Even if April 17th meeting comes along at 6 p.m. and that particular matter, for whatever reason, someone is sick, the engineer isn't available, the plans weren't updated, whatever it happens to be, it can't go forward that night, you can continue it again. But at least everybody that was at your first session knew to come back on April 17th. They showed up on April 17th and they knew to come back again on May 1st. And then you see the, the, the continuity of the public hearing and it, um, the notice survives and carries with it. Um, and of course those notices all have to comply with the open meeting law. We can't just say we're gonna continue it to our next meeting. We still have to put um, that meeting notice out there and put that item on the agenda. Um, the notice under the open meeting law does not replace any other statutory requirement um, that, that might exist for posting or, or notices. This usually comes up with respect to like the planning board and the, and the zoning board. They have a separate statute that requires that they post any of their hearings 14 days prior to the hearing date. They still have to post it 48 hours prior under the open meeting law but they also have um, a 14 day requirement. So if you happen to be on any of those boards or if um, there might be something you know, quirky in a charter or a bylaw that also requires your board to post other things um, sooner than the 48 hours in advance, make sure you comply with both. Right. Yes. Meeting has to be posted at least 48 hours ahead of time. If you have a 14 day notice that you have to post, can you post your meeting at the same time? You could. Okay. You could, there's nothing that stops you from doing it sooner. My guess would be, however, you might wind up revising that meeting notice because between the, the 14 days and the 48 hours, there might be something else um, that comes to light, but that's okay, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. I know you talked about uh, public hearings, but there are some, uh, some boards in town that have a section in their meeting where they do open discussion. There was a case that's been brought to light, and I'm sure that there's out about Southboro, about um, having a per the way a person speaks during open discussion. I don't know if you are familiar with that, uh, so, should, I guess the thing is, are there, when we do open discussion during meetings, is there some type of guidelines that a board should follow or when you do open discussion where you allow the public to speak during a meeting? You know, uh, now that this court case uh, has been brought to light, is it gonna change the way that boards do open discussion? It, it very well might, and um, it's an unfortunate, I mean, I shouldn't say it's an unfortunate decision. I mean, I, I believe in the First Amendment, but, um, you know, we, we've, we've lost some civility in our public <coughs> meetings. Um, I have seen some boards where they um, put something, it, it's like a, a, a permanent message like on the bottom of their meeting notices or they might even make this announcement at the start of their meetings where they remind people that um, you know this is a meeting that is open to the public and while we encourage you know public discourse or public participation um, we do ask people to show respect um, and to be you know mindful of other people's uh, their 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 rights as they stand up and approach the government. The problem is you have no idea what somebody is going to say when they approach the podium under public comment. Sometimes you have no idea what they're going to say, even under you know a specific topic. But public comment is a is a dangerous segment of your meeting. I know, uh, I think it's actually, is it, I think it's actually in the charter or the bylaws that every board's required to have a public comment session. That might be something that gets rethought if it gets out of control. But yes, you can 
you can limit people to, um, you can only speak once, you can't speak for more than two minutes. Um, some boards, I have seen where they require that if you want to speak during public comment, you have to submit something to the chair in advance. Um, that doesn't always work because then someone just shows up at your meeting and says, well, I have a right to be heard. And you know, here you go, you're gonna hear them anyway. Um, I think we're gonna see some issues with that. One of the things that was always taught to me uh, by my department head years ago, he, two words, don't engage. Okay, mm -hmm. if you have someone that's very unruly who comes to your meeting, you know, and they're not, not being very nice and that type of thing, and they're not paying attention, you let them have their three minutes to speak or whatever it is, but don't engage. That's the most important thing because once you engage, then that opens up Pandora's box. Right, and that's um, and that's an important point to make because um, there's there's one board in particular that anytime I attend their meetings, they have a they always have like half a dozen people that show up for public comment, and the chair of the board sits there very calmly with a smile, with his hands folded, and says. Thank you very much. Next, thank you very much. Next, thank you for your comments. And, the, and these people that have just like completely lambasted them for some reason or are just like absolutely furious that something isn't being done and the response is, thank you very much. Um, and I, I, I said to him once, you know, because one, I was actually at a meeting where one member said, that's it? Don't just tell me thank you very much. I want you to do something about this. You know, you know what about you? You know, you're the district counselor. Doesn't this matter to you? It might help set some expectations if people understood that we can have public comment and that is your opportunity to bring things to our attention. But we cannot and we will not engage because the open meeting law requires us to put something like that on the agenda for discussion. So, so a member of the board could say in response to someone, thank you very much, I think that is a topic worthy of a future meeting. And it will then be brought up, and I would, I would you know, hope that you would be able to attend that meeting and provide your input. You could do something like that, but you know, most people, they're not well versed in how this works, they just, get frustrated and think that you're blowing them off when you just say thank you very much. Um, so it, it may help at the start of the meeting to say look, you know, we welcome public comment, we ask people to be respectful. You might actually say we'd like people to not, you know, to refer, by, refer to people by their proper names or their titles so that we don't have, you know, some expletives being, you know, bandied about. Um, but if they violate the rule, <coughs> You as a chair, you do have some right with respect to an unruly participant, but it's kind of like a three strikes you out situation. You know, you can warn somebody once, warn them again. If they continue, you might consider taking a recess, and that suddenly deprives this person of their, you know, their platform. If you suddenly gavel and say, you know, a uh, motion for a five minute recess, and then the board all skedaddles, you know, out to the side room or something, maybe that gives somebody an opportunity to pull this person aside and calm them down. Maybe they get in their car and they leave because they think you've just, you know, adjourned the meeting for the night. Um, maybe you come back in after the recess and they haven't cooled off. You could say, one more time, and I'm calling the police to have you removed from the meeting. You have that right to do that, but you kind of have to build up to it. We can't just say, oh, you just, you know, you just said something derogatory about our police chief. You know, here you go, you're being hauled out. We have to be careful to, you know, sort of balance their right to express themselves, their right to present their grievances to us with when we think they have finally crossed the line. Um, you know, there are some people that I've seen physically removed from meetings. 
Um, so don't hesitate to do that if you feel you need to. Sometimes it's also a public safety issue. So, yes, ma'am. Um, Sandra Cook, ZBA. In our, on our board, we have, um, it, it, it can get very hectic, okay, with, I mean, we're dealing with property owners a lot of times, mm -hmm. and so one person might have to explain to the board, to the audience, um, something about their property that someone didn't, else didn't understand. So then what happens is we have another neighbor that they might have spoken, and now they want to get up and speak again. Any direction with this would be helpful because sometimes it's just spanned to going back and forth, and I just put a halt to it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I understand when they don't have, when they need to um, be ex have something explained to them, you know, by the property owner that they don't like, you know. Um, but it can really get out of hand. So I'm, I'm going to refer you all back to when you had representative town meeting. If you ever went to any of those, you always had the moderator, right? And the moderator would always say, "We don't." We, we don't engage in conversation here. You can ask the question through the moderators, the chair. The chair can't necessarily compel somebody to answer, but if somebody here happens to have some information they want to share that might be helpful, you can follow that same model for a zoning board. So you can remind everybody, and when you do this at every <coughs> one of your meetings, or you just do this when you feel you need to, you can remind everybody that you know, we will get to everyone, we will hear everyone's concerns, but everybody has to go through the chair. There's going to be no discussion back and forth in the audience. No one who's going to, you know, start yelling, well, that's not true, well, that's not true. My surveyor said this, no, we're not going to engage in that. You know, that is not going to be helpful or productive for this zoning board to understand the issues and to make the right or the best decision for the town. So if someone wants to speak, they need to be, you know, raise their hand to be recognized, or they need to come up to the podium and stand in line and wait their turn. Um, you might limit somebody to how many times they can talk. Because we've all, been at those, we've all been at those meetings where we're just like, oh my God, would you sit down? These are other people who want to say something. So you, can, you could say, uh, you could set like a two minute, three minute limit. I have been at meetings where, where we've been in a gymnasium, like, like you're watching a basketball game, and the shot clock goes off. And if you don't think that makes gets people's attention and gets them to stop talking, you'd be, you'd be surprised. It's like, holy cow, you know, all right then. That person then goes to sit down. Yep, so people, people will do that. People will set alarms on their cell phones. You know, let's say you've got three minutes, and you go on and on. You might give the applicant a little more time because sometimes the applicant needs to bring up their traffic engineer or their civil engineer and show the plans and explain things. So you, you might want to think about a little more time for say the proponent as opposed to just members of the public. But you can set a limit on the time that they can speak. You could also um, say we're not going to hear from anyone more than twice until everybody else in the room has spoken. You can also say, look folks, we've heard an awful lot of comments about trap, whatever it might be. Does anybody out there want to talk or want to bring something to our attention that doesn't relate to traffic? We think we have heard all the concerns about traffic. Is there anything else, any new information anyone wants to bring to light? You can use those tools to kind of tamp down or, or prevent your meeting from turning into like a five-hour circus. You can do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, emergencies. So posting of emergencies, I think we talked about this a, a, a little bit. Um, you know, if an emergency comes up, like a water main has burst in the middle of Main Street and the school is flooded, and the school committee needs to suddenly meet to figure out what they're going to do, Board of Public Works needs to meet, whatever it happens to be. You don't need to worry about the 48-hour notice requirement. What you do at that point is post the meeting with as much notice as you possibly can. That might be two hours notice, but two hours is better than nothing. Um, post it, convene the meeting as, as quickly as you possibly can, but only discuss the immediate emergency and the action that you need to take. To address that emergency. That doesn't, you know, just because you have an emergency meeting, 
doesn't suddenly become an opportunity to, well, while we're here, let's also approve some minutes. No, no, no. We're just going to take care of what we absolutely need to um, to, to address the immediate emergency. What I also recommend you do is, at the same time that you are posting that emergency meeting, post a regular meeting with that, 48, that, that complies with the 48-hour notice. Why do I say to do that? Because if there's any question about whether or not this was a real emergency or whether or not you only took action that, you need, that was absolutely necessary to take, if you post another meeting 48 hours later and you put the exact same topics on the agenda, the board can then have an opportunity to properly comply with the open meeting law and ratify any votes that were taken at that emergency meeting. So that if anyone is um, thinking of filing an open meeting law complaint because it's an emergency, um, it would be cured by that subsequent meeting that you posted where you ratified all of your actions. Um, all of the requirements of the open meeting law still complies insofar as you are able to in terms of posting. You still need to um, take minutes um, and um, you know, do as much as you possibly can to satisfy all of the requirements if possible. Remote meetings. Um, so I know, oh yes sir. Two quick questions about the emergency meetings. Uh, does the quorum still apply? It does. It does. So if you can't get everyone together, you can't have a meeting. Right. Um, so I know that at the start of the pandemic, we all suddenly had to scramble and figure out remote meetings. And I believe you guys are all back to in-person meetings. I don't know if there's still hybrids or anything like that. They're all in-person. OK. Um, the uh, remote meeting uh, deadline was supposed to expire as of March 31st, so just uh, three weeks away. Um, as of today, the House and Senate have each passed bills to extend remote meetings to March of 2025. It's, they still have to go to a conference and work that all out. Stay tuned. Uh, not going to affect you guys if you're all meeting in person right now anyhow, but you know, if there's suddenly um, you know, a uh, spike of a new variant or something like that where you decide to go back to remote meetings, I think we're going to see that um, become a part of our everyday life for a while. Um, you know, the same requirements, you do go back to remote meetings. Yes, sir? Just quickly, if you had a special guest, uh, an expert in some field that was going to Zoom in, are you able to do that? Y you are. You are. So that would be sort of a, a Zoom meeting, right? I mean, sorry, a, a hybrid meeting. If you've got your board meeting in person, which it sounds like you are, but your expert, maybe you know, maybe somebody who um, is you know has a health issue, or you know is just not physically uh, able to be in person that night for some reason, you could you could have that person participate remotely. But if you're going to have that person participate remotely. I would suggest that the whole meeting has to be done in a hybrid fashion. Meeting, you might have the board meet, but you're going to also open up public participation remotely so that anybody who wants to hear what this expert might have to say, you know, if they could zoom in too or they could use Teams or whatever platform you use. Um, and then, of course, you need somebody to. Uh, you know, to, to staff that throughout the meeting so that you know, oh, so-and-so in the, in the cyber audience, you know, has a, has a question or has their hand raised and that type of thing, but you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, if we ever do go back to, or if you ever do go back to just uh, remote meetings, whether it's temporarily or uh, on a longer basis, you post the meetings the same way. The only difference is what's the, what's the time and place? Well, it's going to be Zoom, it's going to be Teams, it's going to be whatever the link is. Here's the, here's the telephone call-in number. All that information has to be there. Um, there. There was a point you know, early on in the pandemic where um, some towns required that you had to register to get the meeting link um, in advance. 
So in other words, you'd have to say, I intend to, uh, to, uh, to observe you know, the, the Board of Health meeting on Tuesday night. Can you send me the Zoom link? And then you would get the Zoom link. Um, the Attorney General's office said, no, 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 that's not how that works. You post the meeting, and anybody who wants to show up can show up. You put the link out there. Um, I think that was originally a, a way, if, you, if any of you experienced any Zoom bombing <laughs> early in the pandemic, I think that was one way that towns thought, well, uh, that would be one way to avoid Zoom bombing. By implementing a passcode, I think they figured out how to deal with that. So. Um, that really isn't much of an issue anymore. Um, technology is great, as we all know, as long as it works, but the minute it stops working, we've got to deal with it. Um, so one of the problems with remote meetings or hybrid meetings is you've got to have somebody immediately available who knows what you're supposed to do to get the audio, the video, or whatever it is um, back up and working. If you can't do that, I mean, the, the board could, as soon as you know you've got a technical glitch, you can take a recess, go call your IT person or whoever it is who, who might know how to fix this for you, come back in you know, five or 10 minutes when, when it's all up and running again. If you can't get it back up and running, the only thing you can do at that point is adjourn the meeting, repost it, and pick up again another time. You can't continue the meeting once you know that um, you know, either audio or video is not working, you cannot continue the meeting. Um, also, something else that um, this came up, um, unfortunately, an open meeting law violation in another community. Um, a particular person who was participating remotely um, was accidentally or maybe deliberately <laughs> dropped and blocked. Now, the fact that this person happened to be wearing like a button of a political nature, or the backdrop happened to be something politically aimed at, you know, a member of the board, I'm sure that had nothing to do with it, right? Um, that, that's just all probably, you know, under the Southboro case now, will probably all be protected by the First Amendment. Um, something happened where the, the, uh, the um, admin who was in charge of staffing the uh, remote meeting very honestly said, I don't know what happened. She was gone and then I couldn't get her back in. Okay, well, it's still a violation of the open meeting law because she tried to get back in and she couldn't. And once we knew that she had been dropped, we should have tried to figure out and correct that situation. So, um, yeah. yeah. Bear that in mind. Um, and, uh, is everything on that slide? Uh, we talked about hybrid meetings. Um, one other thing about remote meetings is, uh, or even a hybrid meeting, all of your votes have to be taken um, by roll call. So if you have, uh, if your entire board is in person and you're allowing, you know, uh, remote participation by the audience that's fine, you don't have to take a roll call vote. If you've got two of your board members who are participating remotely and three who are present here, you have to do everything by roll call vote. I have a question. Does yeah. remote participation have to be via video or can it just be audio? It can be audio, okay. but think about, it's encouraged when possible for it to be video as well because there's so much that boards look at and receive, you know, whether it's an application or a site plan or, or a rendering or something like that. Um, I, I suppose there are some boards that aren't as um, you know, exhibit dependent. Um, you know, if that suits your board, that you know, you're not really looking at something, but if it, then you could probably do it all by, um, by audio link. Mm -hmm. But if you're all sitting around looking at and examining a document, it, it really does kind of impact the public's real participation if they can't also see what you're seeing. Um, we've talked about technical difficulties. I'll skip that one. We've talked about public participation. Um, we've talked about executive session. about 
the practical considerations. So meeting minutes, we finally get to meeting minutes. <laughs> um, so you asked earlier whether, uh, with a change in government, whether the rules have changed. And no, the change in government didn't do it, but the open meeting law did change a few years ago. Um, minutes always had to contain, you know, the date, time, and place of the board that met and a summary of the description of anything that was discussed and all of the votes taken. The, the one thing that has changed now, or as to the, the <coughs> minutes themselves, is any document that is either presented to the board, any document that the board substantively discusses during their meeting, has to be listed in the minutes. So at the end of your minutes, I would suggest there be list of documents used, list of documents reviewed, however you want to put it, and start the laundry list of all of the things that people submitted to you, whether they're letters in favor, letters opposed, plans, reports, whatever they happen to be, everything needs to be listed. They don't have to be attached to the minutes, however. But you do have to keep all of those things that were discussed at the, minute, at the meeting somewhere because if someone came in and made a public records request and said, I'd like to see a copy of the board's packet from their meeting of March 7th, you don't want to be scrambling to pull out the minutes from March 7th, run down the list of documents and see if you can recreate it. So most folks from what I'm seeing is, you know, packets are put together for the boards with the, you know, the, the, the agenda and any of the items that are going to be discussed. If you distribute those electronically, one thought is post that electronically. You can still send it out to your board members to their individual email addresses so they know it's been received, but you can also put it up on, on your website as, you know, um, Board of Health packet from, you know, meeting 3-7-2023. And then when somebody says, I'd like to see what the Board of Health was looking at and discussing last night, you can just refer them to that link on the website. Public records response has been complied with in about 30 seconds or less. You are done, you move on. And you don't have to go scrambling for the records. Um, the question I probably get the most on minutes is how much detail do I have to put in there? Somewhere between we discussed, you know, renewal of liquor licenses and a 20-page transcript of everything that was discussed, there is some nice sweet spot in the middle that is essentially what you need to do. And there's, there's no great easy way to, to describe it to you. You don't have to list every single person who talks. You don't have to say, Mrs. Smith spoke in favor, Mr. Jones was opposed, then you know, Mrs. Smith got back up. You don't have to have this sort of um, back and forth like you're describing a tennis match. You do have to give enough information so that think of yourself 10 years later or your successor 10 years later who has to refer back to his minutes and try to figure out, well, well what did they talk about, what went on? And um, I will give you a, a real life example of why does it matter. I've got um, a piece of litigation going on right now involving a 23 year old subdivision. It never got built. And suddenly the developer has come out of nowhere and has said, oh, I'm ready to build my subdivision now. And, and you know, we got scrambling trying to figure out what are you talking about? You want to build your subdivision, what subdivision? The play, since, since so much time had passed, the planning board got permission from the supervisor of public records to destroy their file like eight years ago. So I have been trying to recreate what happened through Board of Health, planning board, sewer commission minutes, like going through and trying to figure it out. I know there was an abutter appeal. I know there was a settlement. Can I find a copy of the settlement? Do I know how that settlement has affected the subdivision, I have no idea. So I, I offer that just as your minutes are really important sometimes when you're trying to recreate that. You never know when someone's going to need to recreate the file or at least figure out what did they do this night? You know, what, what, what votes did they actually take? Or why is it that the decision doesn't match up with the minutes? Um, it, it does matter. 
as much information as you can put in, it does matter. At least it matters to the lawyers. Um, I talked about how you have to list all of the records. The approval of minutes. Um, this is also something that has changed under the open meeting law. It, 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 you now have to approve your minutes either within the next three minute meetings or 30 days, whichever is longer. That's just for a regular session minutes. You know, the idea being we can't go for six months without having approved any minutes. Um, executive session is a little bit different. Executive session minutes, you might, as a board, vote to approve the executive session minutes, but you also have to consider is the purpose for which the executive session was held, is it done? Is it dis has it been you know, disposed of? If it has been disposed of, you can then release those executive session minutes to the public. If the matter is still ongoing, like it might be litigation, um, you don't release those minutes to the public until the litig litigation is resolved one way or another. So, so bear that in mind um, that some folks were under the impression that you don't approve the executive session minutes until the matter is resolved. That might be too long. That could be a couple of years. You don't want to wait that long. Um, you can approve them, but not necessarily release them. But regular uh, session minutes, you've either got three meetings or 30 days to approve those minutes. Um, the other thing is that if someone makes a request for minutes, you've only got 10 days to comply with that request. So even though you might say, well, the board's not even gonna take that up until their next meeting, which is two weeks from now, or we've got you know, 30 days before we have to approve those minutes. If a request comes in, you treat it as a public records request and you've got 10 days to respond. Yes? Um, I'm working with a different town and a request came in, but we also offered, or at least the town asked the engineering, uh, the private engineering firm to provide reasonable fees associated with giving up records and providing that information. Is that applicable to the all of these? It is when you get a, a, a more substantial public records request, um, but usually a public records request for the minutes, yeah. that, that's not gonna apply because number one, it's our job to produce the minutes and to get them approved. Um, so you can't charge for the time that somebody spends actually you know, writing the minutes or mm -hmm. typing the minutes. Um, and usually the minutes are only, you know, I don't know, three to 10 pages long, whatever it is. It's not gonna be worth your 20 or 25 cents a page, whatever it is, to, to collect that. But certainly if you get a request for the traffic report, the, the stormwater report, and all the engineering plans, and you might even have to send some of those plans out to be copied because they're what, 36 by 48 or whatever they are. Yes, you can charge somebody for that and, and send them a cost estimate um, prior to even making the copies. Okay. Um, I already talked about the approval of the executive session minutes. Um, one other thing too is that you can also meet in executive session to review the executive session minutes. Uh, so if the purpose was litigation, you can put that on your agenda um, for the same purpose, and then you can approve your executive session. You might actually need to meet in executive session to talk about your executive session minutes, because if it is ongoing litigation, you don't want to discuss that publicly. So then the enforcement process. Um, as I said, you, you folks, I don't know, to my knowledge, have not been on the receiving end of it, and good for you. Um, a complaint at this point, um, one other thing that has changed under the open meeting law is the um, Attorney General's Division of Open Government has a form that's an actual complaint form on their website. If someone's going to file a complaint, they have to actually put the complaint on that form. They can't send you an email, they can't write you a letter complaining about it, it has to actually be on the Attorney General's form. If you get it by email, uh, you get a, a, you know, an emailed complaint or you get a letter that they write to you, we don't have to respond to it unless it is on the Attorney General's form. 
that complaint gets filed with the board that allegedly committed the violation. So if we're talking about the Board of Health, the Board of Health is going to get a copy of that complaint. The Board of Health then has 14 business days to respond to that complaint. So what I normally do is if, if, um, if I'm told about an open meeting law complaint, I will immediately reach out to the board or look to see when is your next meeting, and I will suggest, okay, we need to meet in enough time that we can get a response from the Attorney General's office. So um, we will either meet in open session, but we can also meet in executive session because an open meeting law complaint is a complaint against a public board. So we can have this discussion in executive session. Um, I usually kind of evaluate what is the nature of the violation before I, I actually say, should we do this in open session or closed session? You know, if the violation is the board hasn't approved any of its minutes in the last six months, do we really need to have a discussion about that in executive session, especially if it's true, you know, we haven't approved our minutes? Wouldn't it just be better to approve the minutes, say mea culpa, and get it all done? Sure. But if the open meeting law complaint has something to do with a little bit more of a sensitive nature, or like a personnel issue, um, or has to do with whether or not they're challenging that you had a proper basis for convening an executive session, odds are that t type of open meeting law complaint should be discussed in executive session too. Um, but you know that's something that, like I said, we, we would have a conversation about and figure it out. Um, we then have to get a written response in to the AG's office. I normally would draft that response I might draft it in advance of your meeting and share a draft because I can glean enough of what has transpired. Or maybe I've talked to the chair or your staff person, and I'm like, okay, I've got a sense of what happened. Or I might need to wait until I actually meet with the board because it's not at all obvious to me what happened. Um, we then decide, do I send the response in? Does the chair send the response in? I know you'd be shocked to know that most of the time, it's, oh, you can sign it, Carolyn, because then that means the Attorney General can call me with any follow-up. Um, that then goes into the Attorney General's office. They then send out this normal email reply to the person who filed the complaint, and they say, we've received your complaint, we've received the board's response. We are now not gonna do anything for 30 days. They wait 30 days to see whether or not the complainant is going to say, I'm not satisfied with the board's response. I want you to look at this. Sometimes they're, they're, the, the complainant is pleased with our response. Sometimes they feel like we've cured it and they don't want to take it further. Other times they want the Attorney General's office to weigh in. Um, I think I have just covered this. So then the final enforcement. So assuming that somebody requests further review by the Attorney General, um, they might, you're, we're going to get a letter that either tells us whether they found a violation or they did not find a violation. Um, in my experience with them, even when they find a violation, um, you know, some folks have said to me, well, I violated the law. I can't violate the law. You know, I'm going to go to jail. No, you're not going to jail. No one's going to jail for this. Yes, it's a violation of the law, but it's generally like a slap on the wrist. Don't do it again. They might suggest that we have open meeting law training like this. They might, um, you know, suggest that the board come up with a better procedure for approving their minutes in a timely manner, whatever it happens to be. They will be generally gracious the first time, the second time, the third time. By the time you're getting past, you know, three violations in a relatively short period of time, they're losing their patience with you. And they don't really believe your excuses anymore. Um, and the letters start to get a little bit more stringent in their tone as far as, if, you know, as we have previously advised you, in this determination, that determination, this is a violation. You still haven't corrected your behavior. You know, any future violations of this nature will be deemed an intentional violation. So you at least get that final warning. 
you violate the open meeting law again, there's a very good chance that it's going to come at the risk of a thousand dollar fine. Um, it's very, that is something new that the open meeting law did not have previously. Um, it's very rarely invoked by the Attorney General's office, but I can sadly tell you of a, a couple of towns that have been fined because there have been just repeat violations. Um, so. It's the town that pays the fine? <laughs> you know, um, it's a good question. I, because that actually came up in, in one particular community. And um, the violation was against the select board, and I think they had some um, discretionary funds, you know, in the budget that they could use for this purpose. Um, but you could see, for example, I mean, I'll, I'll pick on the historical commission. If, if they got hit with a thousand dollar fine, um, do we, they we have, have no the wherewithal in, in a budget to pay for it? I, I don't know. So, yes, sir. Well, it's just like if a board makes a decision and someone tries to sue the board. It isn't like the members of the board, uh, if they lose the case, has to pay anything uh, to the complainant about what the, if they if the board loses the lawsuit. So it's the town that covers that. Right, but at least with when the town gets sued, it's usually the town is acting in the, within the scope of its authority. When a board violates the open meeting law, are we kind of coming? outside of acting within our authority. You know, um, I think I still tend to agree with you that the town would still pay the, the fine, but I can't say that I've actually ever seen the check get issued to see, you know, uh, who's issuing that check, but you're probably right. Um, the Attorney General can also seek a, a, an action in the Superior Court to enforce um, violations. And three residents, um, registered voters, they can also bring an action in Superior Court to enforce the open meeting law. Uh, again, that process I have only seen invoked once, um, but it has happened. Usually they just go through the Attorney General complaint process um, and they don't go much further, but sometimes you, you meet somebody who really believes that they have to take this matter to court. Um, and that is it. We always put the, uh, the links to the Attorney General's um, the Open Meeting Law reference documents you know, at the end. So if you guys have any questions, they've got, they've got the guide to the Open Meeting Law. They've got frequently asked questions. Um, they're pretty well searchable. And I find that they do cover a lot of topics. So you know, feel free um, to use those resources if they might be helpful. And I know we're a little past the time, but I'm happy to answer. Yes, sir. I just have one quick, uh, quick question. Um, I was on the Park and Rec Commission for 12 years. Six of those years I was chairperson. Two, two, three years ago I moved over to the town forest. In my capacity as chairman of the Park and Rec Commission, I had a lot of email communications between me and the director, and me and other board members putting stuff on the agenda and not, no violations of what the meeting was. Am I obligated to keep those emails? Technically, yes. Um, even emails that might be sent from like, your personal email account, um, those are still, if, if it has to do with town business, mm -hmm. which would, yeah, no. um, they would be considered public records that you would have to produce if asked. Okay, for how long? It depends on, this is where email is a little bit fuzzy on the, um, the, the supervisor of public records actually has this records retention schedule which if you ever have insomnia, you know, you might want to look that up one night because you'll drive you crazy trying to figure out what category you fall in. But emails, it depends on emails, it depends upon the nature uh, of, of the topic covered. If the emails back and forth are things like, can you meet Tuesday at two? No, I can meet Tuesday at three. I can't do three, but I could do five. You know, those kinds of things, they say has like no value to them. They can they can almost be deleted after they've been read. If you are actually talking about a report or maybe uh, you're collaborating on, you know, drafting um, a report to, you know, to the town council or something like that, those of a more substantive business, those you would have to retain for generally seven years. If you have any personnel emails, 
which I would hope you do not, but if you have any related to um, you know, any personnel actions, um, those I think you have to keep for 20 years post-termination of the employee. So what you might want to do with those is hand those over to HR so you just don't have to worry about it. That'll be their headache. Okay. And then all these laws apply to appointed boards and elected boards. There's no difference. Appointed or elected makes no difference. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, so, getting back to the kind of close the beginning when we were talking about the judges and how specific we need to get. Um, if we post copies of the reports with the agenda, does that cover those bases? I mean, because, I mean, if you have to copy half a report to fill out an agenda, just attach the report and, and you know, health agent's report, it's right there. you will know exactly what we're going to discuss. Right. I, you know, I think the Attorney General's office, they can be a little rigid in the way they say, well, the law says you should list everything that's going to be discussed. So if you ask them, they would say, if the report has five topics, you should list those five topics on your meeting notice. But if the meeting notice says, you know, a superintendent's report, town manager's report, whatever it is, and it says, you know, see report dated March 7th, you know, attached. You're, in, my, in, in my opinion, I don't know attorney general, but in my opinion, you're complying with the spirit of the law because you are putting it out there. You're actually providing more detail by putting the full report out there as opposed to just listing the five topics. I mean, I'm the chairman of the Board of Health. I mean, the Board of Health has come up a few times to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I didn't mean to pick on I, I, That's <laughs> fine. No, I, I did not feel picked on I am just, just pointing that out. Um, no, but, uh, you know, my health agent's report. Well, he's going to he's going to basically cover uh, housing inspections, uh, yeah, housing code violations, uh, restaurant inspections, uh, Title V, but in, in your example, you know, you were talking about a rat infestation at 123 Main Street. Well, that's going to show up on the inspections. Mm -hmm. Do I have to li actually list? I mean, I might as well just list his report because that's what his report is. It's a list of addresses. Yeah, yeah. I, like I said, I, I think in my opinion, you could just attach the report, okay. put on the agenda, you know, health director's report, report dated, whatever, is attached, and make sure it does all get posted. Um, you know, if it's, if the report's not ready, when the meeting notice gets posted, you're going to have to fill in some topics. Under that, um, under that item, but okay. like I said, you, you happen right now to be in a community where you don't get a lot of open meeting law complaints. You just put the as, as, <laughs> yeah. I had to say that. <laughs> as, my, as my mother used to say to me, just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's not you know, but. You know, it's true, like, I, that's what you've just hit upon. It's like one of the biggest complaints I get from towns. So They're just like, I'm just online. I looked at, like, 50 different agendas throughout, you know, all these other communities. They all just have report reports. Like, yes, I know, I know. But until you've been dinged by the Attorney General, you can. So, so basically, what you're saying is that until somebody complains, we don't really have to worry about it. <laughs> I did exactly now say that. that just changed so, yeah. <laughs> I'll ask this question. So you talk about new business and old business. Mm -hmm. It's part of your agenda, but you really don't have anything in those. They're just, just leave, just put new business. As long as there's nothing that's actually planned in those, um, you can leave that just as it stands. You could, of course, that also begs the question, well, then why put it on, the, on there at all? Well, I mean, somebody's... Because it's almost like we have a template, right? And we fill this in. Well, that's what I'm you saying. You know, it's consent it's calendar, that. approval of minutes, none. I'm like, well, why put it on the agenda at all? It, it just, it's just a form that somebody is filling in. Right. Yeah. 
you know, and if there is no new business, you, and, and you're very comfortable just using the form, you could just put none. Right, okay. That's what I do. Right. Well, you could remove new business entirely or put none, you know, then, uh, and then that, that kind of removes the mystery around it. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, and thank, thank you for thank the you. questions and making this a lot more lively. <laughs> hope I didn't, um, hope I returned the favor. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you.